Years ago, I was working nights as a phlebotomist, the person who draws your blood, in a hospital. There was this doctor who was notorious for ordering recurrent tests incorrectly. He would order a single draw when he really needed a serial draw 90% of the time. But because one in 10 times he really did want a single, you always had to check with him. This night happened to be the start of daylight savings. So at 1.59 a.m., the clocks would turn to 3 a.m. instead of 2. At about 1.30, I get an order on my screen from this doctor. I was the only phleb on nights and I worked with two techs. I sighed and showed them. Oh look, Dr. X ordered this test again. I'll see if he's on the floor and if he really wants this or if he wants the serial draw. I went up to the floor and he was at the nurse's station. I remember it so clearly because he was wearing plaid black and yellow skinny pants under his white coat. I couldn't stand the guy and I thought his loud, ugly pants just drew attention to his loud, ugly personality. I walked up to him and said, hey, I just got this order for XYZ patient. Did you mean to order the three serial draws? He was dismissive and said something like, of course I did, can you just draw three? I, of course, cannot just come poke a patient three different times without orders. So I asked him if he could reorder it and I would go back to the lab to print the stickers and come right back and do the first draw. I drew a couple of patients quickly knowing that he would take a few minutes to get the order in. I rode the elevator back to the lab and checked my computer. It was 1.58 and the orders were there. So I printed them and stuck my specimens in the centrifuge while they printed. I pulled the labels off the printer and looked closely and realized that he had ordered the single draw yet again. I pulled up the order code, wrote it down for him, and went back to the floor to just ask him to do this order exactly. When I got to the floor, he was standing exactly where he had been when I came up the first time, wearing plain black pants. I assumed somebody had forced him to change, and I knew he was going to be really annoyed when I asked him to reorder the labs. By now, it was definitely past 1.59, so the clocks were reading three-something. I asked him if he could reorder the test. He was totally pleasant and not at all frustrated that I was asking him again. I asked him if room 2008 had thrown up on him or something, and if that's why he had changed his clothes. He then seemed offended and was like, what are you talking about? I was like, Sorry to offend, but when I came up to you earlier, you had on yellow pants, so I just assumed something happened. He scoffed at me and said, I've been wearing these all night. I don't own yellow pants. You must be confused. I'm thinking he's just being weird and should just admit he got puked on, but whatever. I go back to the lab, print the orders, and finally draw the patient. I stop to talk to one of the nurses for a moment, and on my way back down, she says something like, I saw you talking to Dr. X. He's being weird tonight, right? And she seemed kind of shaken. I said, yeah, he was wearing those hideous pants and then tried to pretend he wasn't. She told me that he walked into a room on one side of the wing wearing the yellow pants right before the time change, and then, walked out seconds later from the other side of the wing, wearing black. I was weirded out and went back down to the lab where the techs asked me where the samples were for the patients that I had drawn after first asking Dr. X to reorder. I opened the centrifuge I had left them in and they weren't there. The orders showed that the labels had never been printed and when I apologetically went to redraw the patients, they had no idea who I was and didn't have cotton or tape on their arm from where I'd drawn them earlier. I still have absolutely no explanation for this. It appears that everything between first receiving the incorrect order and returning to ask him to reorder for the second time never happened. The text didn't remember me showing them that he had ordered incorrectly the first time or anything. The only reason I didn't check into a psychiatric facility was the nurse who corroborated my story. 
We hardly knew each other at the time, but we like trauma bonded over the experience and we've talked about it so many times. The weirdest part to me is that it coincided with daylight saving starting. That is completely a societal construct. Nothing actually happens when we move the clock, so what the heck? I still get the chills when I think or talk about it. And because people always question why I was so tuned into the clocks and to know exactly when things happened, I was a worker whose shift was an hour shorter that night. We all kind of watch the clock and do a mini celebration when it changes. When I was 15, my parents made the decision that they wanted to build their own farmhouse in the southern pasture, doing away with the mistakes of our old house and improving on a few concepts. I, being the mountain boy that I was, was ecstatic. I no longer had to drudge a half mile to my trap line, a mile down, a mile back, and a half mile to the house, and then get ready for school. The trap line would be 200 yards from my front door, all big projects start somewhere, and ours started with water. See, we always had a problem with iron water at our old house. It stained everything, changed how the food tasted, and God forbid you had anything white. So Dad borrowed a bulldozer and an excavator off of a friend for a few days, built a sturdy road down to the bottoms, and dug footers for the house. But first, we had to see if we could get a good well on the property. It's well known that a certain sect of my family could witch water and had an old drilling truck. But first, silver had to cross hands, a jug of good shine had to be shared, and the rest poured out afterwards. My sister and I would see if we also had the gift. My cousins came down and checked the land with three things, a fresh forked peach limb, a pure silver pocket watch, and finally, a set of heavy copper wires bent into an L. The peach limbs marked the prospects, the watch pole told the depth of the water, and the copper told of its purity. Us kids had to stay up on the hill until they were done, and one by one, we were called down and instructed how to find water and mark it. My sister was down there about a half an hour, and then I got the call. When I went down, I was given four flags, instructed how to do it, and set out with a peach limb. Where it pulled the hardest, I marked the spots while my dad and the cousins looked on from the truck. I was next given the pocket watch, and was told to tell them which one pulled the hardest. After that, I was given the copper tines and told to tell which one crossed the quickest. After much testing, I came up with the one weaving down through our sugar maple patch, where we made maple syrup. Well, apparently I was dead on, and I was congratulated by all attending of my gift. But I digress, on to the creepy part. The next day, they brought the rig up, trimmed some trees so they could stand it up, and started drilling on my spot. At 50 feet, they hit water unexpectedly. Short job, right? Well, Dad had talked them into drilling a few holes in the creek through the bedrock, so he could blast a few big holes in the creek for trout and a swimming hole. He had already cleared out a road down to the creek and cleaned off a section of bedrock, diverted the creek to the other side, and prepped them a spot to drill. The creek is probably 30 feet wide from bank to bank and is easily crossed dry-footed on dog days, but never goes completely dry. They take the rig down, drive it through the pasture, turn it around and back it out on the bedrock. Dad took the dozer and was clearing off a section on the other side of the pasture, and I was watching him for about an hour or two when my cousins come running up to my dad, yelling for him, saying he had to come, and pulling them back up the bank. The cousins were saying that he wasn't going to drill any more holes in the creek bed. Some words were exchanged, and Dad backed the dozer down, hooked up the rig, and dragged them back into the pasture. The weirdest thing was, they then set up the rig 50 yards from the creek and started drilling a test hole. When they got about four lengths down, they pulled it up and went back another 50 yards and drilled another, 
finally satisfied in what was going on. I, on the other hand, had walked around them and walked down to the creek to where they had just drilled. Dad couldn't turn all the creek against the hillside, not enough backfill and too much bedrock. What I saw was a drill hole down through the rock with a small stream of water disappearing into it. Come to find out, they had hit an underground cavern at six feet, and it just went. It extended about 50 yards out into our pasture, and maybe another 40 yards beyond that. We had to rearrange where we were going to put the house it came so far. We went back down to the creek with a tape measure. The tape measure maxed out, so we got a 100-foot tape and put it down. It maxed out. We got a spool of balers twine, tied a rock to it, put it into the hole, and we all sat there for half an hour while Dad fed that twine down into the hole off the spool. Finally, he said screw it and cut the twine. He just looked at us and said, It's too damn deep. He gingerly drove the dozer back into the creek, smoothed everything up, covering the hole, and that was it. Dad passed away seven years ago this October. I walked down to the creek and fished it this spring for a mess of brookies. The creek changed and scraped itself clean in a few sections in the spring. One of the places it scraped clean was the bedrock where the hole is. Water is still flowing down that hole all these years later, and it is never filled up. I'm telling this story to maybe get some help in identifying what I saw, because I've been trying to figure it out for three years. I was a U.S. Marine from 2014 to 2019. I deployed to the Philippines to help out some joint operations. It was right after the siege of Marawi. Basically all we did was stare at the top of the jungle canopy looking for heat signals, and then communicating fire missions for artillery. We were about three months into the deployment, and like four hours into this mission, staring at absolutely nothing. We were over the mountains of Basilon, with really thick jungle canopy. Even with infrared, it's really hard to see anything out there. It was like trying to find needles in a haystack with Vaseline in your eyes. But when something's above the canopy, like a helicopter, birds, or monkeys in the trees. It pops up, and you can really get some good definition depending on how good the camera operator is, and atmospherics, of course. I was the camera guy, and I was just chilling, staring into the void while my pilot burned circles into the sky for hours. I asked my officer in charge of the flight if I could go smoke while the pilot took over the camera after I locked on to a geopoint to keep the camera from going all over the place, and he said yes. So I go smoke, and not a minute later, I hear the guy inside flying go, uh, hey dude, you should get back in here and look at this. So I go back inside all pissed off because I hadn't got to finish my cigarette, but then I see what my pilot had locked the camera onto. I hopped back into my seat, and I took back control. I was like, all right, is it cows or Isis? But it's none of those things. It's just flying above the canopy at a pretty good clip, flapping and gliding on what I can only assume are very large pointed wings. At this point, it's just a very dark shape moving over the canopy until I clean up the infrared image and start to pick out more. At first, I'm like, dude, it's just a really big bird. But then I see like a rounded head at the front and a small space in between what I assumed was the tail, making me think it had some kind of legs. The detail wasn't amazing, but you could make out general shapes. If I have a good day for atmospherics and light and altitude, I can tell an RPG from an AK-47 if I'm lucky that kind of detail. Then my smart, college-educated officer is like, check the measuring tool. It looks kind of big. 
We have a tool that uses geodata altitude and the aircraft's position, allowing you to use the laser and the program to let you know how far a distance is between two points. We mostly use it to measure buildings and artillery shot distances, but given what we had in the height of the canopy, I didn't see why it wouldn't work for this too. So I take a screen cap of my cam and I send it to my pilot to work on while I'm still on lock. He does the math and he comes up with a roughly six foot length and a 17 foot wingspan. As I watched it fly, I just kept thinking, that looks like a bat. Just the way that it flapped and moved and the general shape. It wasn't a bird and its wings definitely came out at like an angle and stretched you know, just like a bat. But there's no bat that big. The crew and I talked about it, passed it up to hire, but eventually we had to actually go do our jobs instead of become amateur zoologists. But after that flight, I just couldn't shake that feeling or place what it was. The other thing was that right next to our smoke pit, when we're not flying the drones, there's this thing that's absolutely filled with fruit bats and it glows in infrared. This thing didn't. So my pilot and I got curious and we started asking the local people and contractors who worked at the chow hall and at the PX. A bunch of them laughed and told us that it was because we stay up too late and we work too long on night shift. But a couple of the older ones told us about an oswang or a tik tik. Sometimes people call it a mananangal. Apparently, it's this big old flying thing that eats babies. But in an effort to disprove giant baby-eating women man bats, can somebody please tell me what I saw? Because I would much rather my spicy PTSD just be regular PTSD. This is the story of Madeline, the doll that has my face. For context, my mom is the original owner of Madeline, but Madeline has been mine since I was a child. Madeline was bought by my mother about 35 years ago, long before I was born. There's a possibility that she's a lot older than that, as she was second hand when my mom bought her. These are my experiences with this doll. I'm well aware that creepy doll is a trope, but stay with me. Madeline, I named her, is a porcelain doll with a soft body filled of horse hair, with her hands and feet and face made of plain white porcelain. Her hair, according to a doll expert I had her repaired by a few years ago, is a combination of horse and human. She's about 30 centimeters long, with brown hair, blue eyes, wears a blue cotton dress with embellishments, black leather lace-up boots, and a somewhat Victorian underdress. I believe she was pretty common, a generic doll type. I base this off the fact that I took her to doll shows as a child to find out a little bit more about her, since she doesn't have any marks. And another lady had her almost exact identical replica. Same dress, same colors, hair, and everything. So she must have been pretty common. The only difference? The face. The lady and I compared the dolls, vividly pointing out how my doll's face was almost identical to mine. I'm not saying it's impossible to have dolls who look somewhat similar to you. I mean, that's just good marketing, really. But at the time, I had a jaw problem that required surgery, and the doll's jaw perfectly matched mine. Heavy overbite. This lady's doll didn't at all. Given the dolls had everything else exactly the same except the face, it just sort of makes me wonder if at some point her face had been replaced or repainted before my mom purchased her. I don't believe Madeline to be a harmful entity, but a few strange things have happened that make me wonder. As a child, I kept her on my bed on the top bunk. I had one of those loft beds with a desk under it while I was at school. If someone was to change the sheets, they'd put her back because mom was always worried that the dog would eat her. She was always on my bed and I was the only kid in the house. 
so I'm the only one who played with her at the time. At school one day, I would have been about 10 years old, I broke my right wrist. Most children will break something in childhood, and I had fallen out of a tree. I remember getting home from the hospital at about 8 p.m., and I was a bit dopey from the assistance they'd given me. Because I couldn't climb the bunk in a cast, Mom made me up the mattress on the ground. I had grabbed Madeline so that Mom could move the bed, when suddenly, Madeline's right hand dropped onto the carpet. I would brush this off, but more has happened. Once I needed stitches in my head. I came home and there was a chunk of Madeline's hair gone. I had jaw correction surgery. Now neither of us have an overbite. I've had knee surgery and have a scar on my right foot. And she has just had a crack repaired on her right foot. Mom, who hadn't seen her in a few years, as I've had things in storage, recently made a comment and it's what made me decide to tell my story. She said, I remember her having a much younger looking face when you were little. Could this doll be aging with me, experiencing things like I am? I really don't know what it means, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I live in a three-story, four-bedroom new house. Prior to it being a house, this plot of land was a residential home, and before that, I have no idea. My partner, our young children, and I have lived here since it was built, nearly six years ago. I've never felt anything bad or good in this house, except for the bedroom on the top floor. That bedroom was our youngest child's bedroom. It was her bedroom from about six months old until about two years. She never slept well, ever. She would always wake up during the night, sometimes crying uncontrollably. We just put it down to her being a crappy sleeper. However, sometimes if we couldn't settle her back down, we would bring her into our room, which was directly next to her room. She would just sit and stare into the hallway outside and would refuse to be put down near the doorway and if we tried to carry her out into the hallway to show her nothing was there, she would freak out. She no longer has that room as her bedroom. She shares with her older sisters now. The middle child, a boy, now has that bedroom, and he claims to feel fine in there. However, when it was our youngest daughter's bedroom, she would wake in the night, and my partner would go downstairs to make her a bottle, and I would go in to comfort her. While comforting her with my back to the door, I would always feel like there was something or someone watching me, so much so that I would feel forced to glance back over my shoulder. That's the backstory. During a conversation we were having as a family tonight, myself and my partner were talking to the eldest child, 15 years old, and she just so happened to sleep in her brother's room last night. He was at a sleepover at a friend's house and she wanted to escape the two younger ones. We asked her how she slept. Totally normal question, and we certainly didn't lead her answer in any way. She said, eh, not so great. I felt on edge, like somebody was watching me from the doorway. I wasn't scared, I just felt anxious. How she described her feelings was exactly how I had felt in the past, when I would often be in there comforting our youngest. Neither my partner nor myself have ever spoken to the children about this before so there's no way she was just regurgitating what we've said. I felt a shiver go up my spine when my stepdaughter said this tonight because it was so accurate. My partner immediately looked at me as if to say, wow, that's exactly what we've said. A friend recommended we invest in some selenite to place in and around the room, and we might do that. But I just wanted to share this story and see if anybody else can relate. So this isn't anything too crazy, but I do have a little story about my childhood home. It was the summer of 2012. Life was good. 
and I was up at 2 a.m. watching Teen Nick in my house's den. The whole house was always fascinating to me. One of the first houses built in our small town in Kansas during the Prohibition as a moonshiner's illegal party house. The whole house is a colonial style full of Victorian features. From the outside, it looks like a two-story, but there are actually three floors and a half a basement. The architecture was always confusing as to how this was accomplished, but wedged between the top and main floor is a log cabin themed room, our family room and den. It was a glorified bar room fitted with a monstrous fireplace, an Alaskan moose head from about 1920, and a salvaged chandelier from the former Douglas Opera House. I always hated being in that room at night because I always got a weird sensation, like someone standing over me when I would try to sleep on the couch after a long night of TV. My best friend and I also felt like this from time to time, sleeping in my own bed, which used to be the master suite. Never could get the cat or the dog to hang out in the den, though. Its door was an inch thick of solid wood and had a very complex lock that remained tucked inside its latch since no previous owners had the key. We never bothered to close it. It would get stuck in the frame because it was so heavy, designed to keep the police out if someone tipped off a booze party. There was a nursery on the top floor that shared a wall with this room. It was sold to us with no doorknob to the small four by 10 room. It became our home office. There was a brand new computer and an all-in-one printer and fax machine that remained unplugged, rarely used. My bedroom was right next to it and I always slept with my door open. In the middle of the night, I could often see the computer light up and paper would cycle through the printer. The unplugged printer. Could never get myself to check it out until the morning. Whenever I looked on the sheets, there was nothing on them and we would just load them back inside. It was my sister and I's favorite place to pirate scary movies. We would close the door so as not to disturb mom and dad since it didn't latch. But one night, she left me in the room to go get a snack. And when she came back, she couldn't open the door. I was trapped inside. My mom had to use a butter knife to force the handle. I was kind of shook given the timing. But back to the den. I'm minding my teen Nick business when out of the blue I get a call from my friend. She tells me that she's doing a Ouija board session, which I've always done my part to stay far away from. She says that her presence told her to call me. She informed me that I was wearing a black shirt, which I was and I only own one. I hung up the call and immediately went to my bedroom to wait out the next few hours to daylight. That same summer, my mom, grandma, sister, and I went on one of our late night drives where we would blast oldies cruising the back roads. As we were driving, an unidentifiable creature ran in front of our car and across the road. None of us agreed on what we saw. We thought that it was a very large white rabbit or cat or small dog. It was moving unthinkably fast for any of those animals though. It made it across the road in two hops. At the time, we joked about it and kept on our way. When we got home and stepped into the foyer, heavy work boots start down the upstairs hall and down the stairs. They stop at the den level. From the foyer, you can see the part of the staircase that leads to the den, and no one is there. We're all looking at each other, waiting for my father to continue his trip down the stairs. Then he comes up from the basement, followed by our dog. The cat is chilling in a window on the main floor. We sent him upstairs to investigate. He checked everywhere, even the attic, and there was nothing. Could all be a coincidence. When we moved into an apartment that fall, nothing else strange seemed to happen though. I'm tempted to ask the family who lives there now if they've ever experienced anything. The original owners are buried in the morgue just down the street. And sometimes I think they make a trip to their old home.
So I always thought this was strange. I even told people about it, but chalked it up to people working overnight or something. But now, I'm not so sure. I worked for one of the biggest tech companies for about 10 years. I traveled a lot and sometimes taught workshops. I remember visiting Puerto Rico to deliver a workshop. I was really impressed with the people in the office. They were serving lunch on silver dishes and had a really classy atmosphere. It was a company location, so there were no customers in the office. One strange thing that happened, but not necessarily weird, was after eating lunch with the students, I'd started teaching again. And little by little, the office people would just casually walk in, right past the projector and me lecturing and grab lunch. I wasn't mad, I actually found it kind of funny. Besides, the staff had some good looking and generally nice people, so there's that too. The strange part was that I remember after one class cleaning up for the night and visiting the bathroom before leaving, and I noticed that it was a bit aged. Maybe leaking faucets and water stains, nothing gross, but it was definitely an old bathroom. There were several stalls and urinals. Now, I left likely at around five o'clock and the office was closing down. The next day when I visited that bathroom, it was completely different and looked brand spanking new. I'm talking marble, tile, everything looked like it had literally been done overnight. I remember mentioning this and really getting no response from anybody. That night was when the oil refinery blew up. I booked my flight a day early and got out. I was afraid that it was either an attack or the smoke would force the airport to be closed down, which would cause havoc with me trying to get home. I never did figure out what was going on there with that bathroom or with the people. Looking back on it, maybe they weren't real either. Or maybe it was some kind of glitch. I've mentioned this a few times to people over the years as a funny story, thinking that they had actually remodeled this bathroom overnight. But now that I think of it, there's no possible way that they did that. I was leaving when the office was getting ready to close. There were no signs, no workers coming in, and no recollection of the employees the next day. Plus, this work wasn't just a makeover. Like I said, it was granite counters, tile walls, the works. It was just very strange. All the homes in my neighborhood were built in 2009 or 2010, seven homes in all. One of the homes across the street was purchased by a single female with two boys and a child on the way. Her boyfriend did live with her, but didn't help purchase the home, and he was not a good guy. They fought all the time. I'm pretty sure he was on meth, and he cheated on her constantly. He even tried to approach me, so I reiterate, not a good guy. Toward the end, he started getting abusive, she had him locked up, but let him come back when he got out. One day, an ambulance showed up at the home. We were all told that he had committed suicide, had gotten high on meth and shot himself in the bathroom. All right, this was believable. After his death, she asked me to help her watch the home as his friends and family were accusing her of killing him and were pulling up into her driveway and then leaving and basically just trying to harass her. I thought this was suspicious, but whatever. As a single mom, she had to work all the time. The oldest boy would watch the little one while she worked. He would always come down to my house to stay, but wouldn't tell me why. But I liked the kid, so no worries. About four years went by like this and she told me she was moving. I was kind of shocked because these were really nice homes and fairly cheap, but I figured it was just because of what had happened previously. Finally, she told me that they were moving because of the paranormal activity in the home since his death. The little one was the most bothered by it, and that's why he stayed at my house all the time. She proceeded to tell me what really happened. They were in a fight, and he had a gun in his hand and was threatening to shoot her. 
They had a struggle over the gun, resulting in him shooting himself behind the ear. He fell to the ground, crawled down the hallway, and died in the living room. The little one said that he could see him at night, crawling down the hallway. The doors would open and close on their own, and they would hear disembodied voices and feel negative energy, stuff like that. She said her guests would see and hear stuff too. She wouldn't go into much detail, and I understood why. I didn't press the issue. The boys were struggling in school, and she wasn't doing so well either. They moved, and the house sat empty for about a year now. Well, my daughter and her husband have decided to purchase this home. I asked them what they would do if they saw him crawling down the hallway at night. They joke about it, but I mean, come on. That would be some scary shit. If you've never really experienced anything paranormal before, or hell, even if you had. My son-in-law is a huge skeptic, but my daughter has had some experiences. I wonder if it's still active or if he moved on when they left. A morbid part of me can't wait to find out. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything. 
but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me, unless he's called over, and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there, and my wife starts jogging at me, and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him, and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can, some coins, and keys from our truck, and zip-tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night, we heard no footsteps, and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today, and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary, and I noticed the clusters smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him 
and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. This happened a couple of years ago, when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver-looking pistols as a sidearm. On one of those occasions, I brought my girlfriend to the Nerf War with me. For some context, my girlfriend's my neighbor, she lives in the same area I do, and we've known each other for some time, since around preschool, I think. As you do for a Nerf War, you pack up spare darts, spare mags, etc. So the Nerf War ended and we had a great time as usual, and we went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I start walking back home, my paranoia kind of kicks in, and I have a feeling that someone is following us. I glanced back slightly, and there was a guy in full black. At first I thought it was just one of my friends awkwardly following us, but then I remembered that none of them were wearing full plain black that day. So I turn back to my girlfriend and tell her that I think we're being followed. She glances back slightly and sees the same guy. She starts panicking, so I tell her to calm down. It's probably just some guy going to the subway as well. So we get on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. As I'm making sure my rifle isn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store my Nerf rifle even when it was taken apart, so I just had it slung around my waist. I feel my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. Then she whispers, telling me that the man was on the train as well and was staring at us. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's crap. I was tired and the last thing I needed was some dude stalking my girlfriend and I. Luckily, our stop was two stations away. So when we got there, we bounced right out of that car. I looked back and the man was indeed behind us. We get up to the streets, hoping that there would be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see my girlfriend and I. But the streets were basically empty, with only a couple of people going back home. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared as all hell. I told her my plan, and with some hesitancy, she agreed to it. I stopped moving to take a drink of water, my girlfriend shifting her hand toward my leg so it wouldn't be as obvious. It was dark at the time. I felt her hand being ripped away from my leg, and I heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, the stock of my Nerf rifle. The stock's attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them, so it wouldn't take long to pull it on or off. My stock was pretty big. It wasn't metal, but it was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. I whacked the guy around the face, grabbed my girlfriend's hand, and got out of there. We waved down the closest taxi, got on, and sighed, happy that we weren't being followed by some guy. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. Because of that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while. My Nerf's been stored in my Nerf armory for a couple of years, untouched. Every time I think of it, this incident comes to mind. In order to set a little background, this took place in Western Wyoming. It was a small town, and at the time it had maybe 2,500 people. This was the first home that I lived in during the time that I spent in Wyoming. We moved here because of my dad's job. The family and I weren't very enthusiastic because we loved our home in Oklahoma. My dad and mom went up and looked for houses without us so that we could finish school and wouldn't have to stay in a hotel. The housing market wasn't doing so well and the choices were very limited. In fact, it came down to one choice. The house that we had to move into was built in the 1930s, and it was rather different from the house we moved out of. 
It was single story with a large basement. The staircase to the basement was immediately to the left when you walked into the front door. No door at the bottom and the steps were steep. It was fairly dark without any lights on. We move in within three weeks of being told that we're moving. My dad spent the first night there alone and never told us what he experienced until years later. We were about eight to 13 years old between my brother and sister, so he didn't want to scare us. He decided to sleep in the basement because the TV was down there and the basement was fairly large. He said that it was late, around 2 a.m., when the TV turned on to static by itself. He's not bothered too much by it, but then he hears a door creak open and some footsteps. After doing a little investigating, he lays down again but doesn't sleep much due to weird noises. Jumping forward sometime, this would be my first odd experience that would make me a believer later on in life. Every night, my sister and I would pick a VHS movie from a large bookshelf in the basement. Since I was too afraid to sleep in my room in the basement, we slept in a bunk in my sister's room. My mom tells us that it's time to put in a movie and go to bed, so we agree to head downstairs. My first choice was one of my two favorites, which was The Land Before Time. I asked my sister, without turning around, does Land Before Time sound good to you? After about a minute, I get impatient, and I say, well, how about The Lion King then? Not much more time passes and I get upset, and I tell her, fine then, if you're not gonna say anything, we're gonna watch my movie. As I slowly turn around to address my sister, I see that nobody is there. Here's the real kicker. I look back to the large bookcase and see two shadows, plain as day. My shadow, which is to the left, and a smaller shadow that clearly looks like a little girl on the right. This is when I realize something is not right and I freak out. After screaming and starting up the stairs, I take one final look back to see that the little girl is moving down the hallway to my room. Well, at least her shadow is. There was absolutely nobody in the basement to produce that shadow. The shadow disappears into my room and then to top it off, the light comes on. So I'm screaming bloody murder at this point and I run to tell my parents. They tell me that it was just my imagination. So then I ask where my sister is and they tell me that she's been in her room waiting for me to bring up a movie. Again, years later, I get told that they had both seen a little girl in the house too. They knew full well that it was not my imagination. The last thing that happened was to my brother. He had a room in the basement, but he wasn't a chicken like I was. One late night, he was woken up to his door creaking open. He thought it was me because sometimes I would get scared and come sleep with him. After a few moments, he said a small head peeked through the door. He said, what's wrong, buddy? Can't sleep? The door slowly shuts and he hears footsteps down the hall to my room. He decides to get up and come see what, who he thought was me, was doing. After leaving his room, he sees my light is on and my door is open. He walks into the room and every single toy from my wooden toy box is out. This is very unusual for me because my parents were quite strict and would kick my butt if I left my room like that. He asks me the next day what I was doing down in my room so late, and I had no idea what he was talking about. My mom vouched that I was passed out in her room after we all watched movies. To sum up this story, my brother and I both had recurring dreams about a little blonde girl being stuffed into my toy box in the closet. Another dream that we both had was this kind of tall old man beating us in the basement bathroom. We've come to think that maybe a kid was killed in that house and the negative energy manifested because of that. Something I forgot to mention, all the toys were cleaned up the next day and were meticulously placed, all standing up in an odd order. Nobody in my family ever placed them like that and no one had been in the basement aside from my brother and he said that he certainly didn't do it. In any case, 
I'm really glad we don't live there anymore. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around, checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house they always ran up to the side with the driveway as though they were trying to see who arrived and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs as though somebody was standing right behind me. And one time I heard a whisper that said, come play. I prayed a lot and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down and that helped as well. One time my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker, it was just a regular lid and pot. Another time we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, 
There was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night, and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house. A boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom, where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking, and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. I grew up in the countryside, right next to a national park frequently visited by nature lovers and bird enthusiasts. It was the kind of park where you're not really allowed to bike or ride horses, only walk or run. But 10-year-old me thought that was a stupid rule, and I did so anyway, because the trails were perfect for it. I knew full well that I wasn't supposed to do that, and I was caught a few times, but nothing much came of it apart from a half-hearted, don't do it again. And I did, of course, until one day something frightening happened that made me stop. My family were horse breeders, and I would often take one of the horses for a ride, usually in the Forbidden Park. This day, very early in the morning, the first day of the summer holiday, it was beautiful outside misty and foggy, yet a sky that promised a sunny day ahead. Since it was so early, before six o'clock, I knew there wouldn't be anybody on the trail to see me, so I let the horse set off full speed along the trail. I only slowed down on the part of the trail that got steep on one side leading down to the river, because the thought of one step too close to the edge was too much even for a kid with the next to non-existent risk assessment skills. Suddenly the horse came to a halt and refused to go any farther. I grew up with horses all my life, and I knew that that usually indicates you need to investigate. Is there something with the hooves? Did the horse spot something that spooked it? The hooves were fine, but the horse wouldn't move an inch. And that's when I saw it. Someone had set up a trap, a thin, sharp metal wire across the trail at perfect neck height for an adult. I stopped and looked around, but I didn't see anybody. The wire was well attached to two trees and impossible for me to remove, so I led the horse around it. And to do so, I had to walk a bit up into the wooded area on the side of the trail. This is when I heard singing. There's a song called Hey Tom to Gubar, and it was that melody, but the lyrics were different and sung in a muffled, sniggering voice. Today, I only remember parts of it, but
but it translated into something like, hey, all you runners come here passing, let the lifeblood pour out. I, as silently as I could, and with my heart in my throat, backed away, got up onto the horse, and hurried back the way I'd come as fast as I could. I knew that I had to tell somebody about it, but at the same time, I wanted to avoid admitting to riding a huge and very forbidden horse on those protected trails, so now I had a problem. The old stories about a man living in the shed in the woods, a shed that was once a cottage for the local hunter, came back to me as I hung onto the horse for dear life. I got home and I told my older brother what had happened, and he went back there with me in tow. We found the wire trap, and after a while of searching, we also found a spear-like pole in the ground, right on the spot where you would land if you came running and jumped over the fallen tree on the trail. That's when we called the police. The area was searched and several similar traps were found, but there was no sight of the old man. The following summer though, there was big news in the local paper about spear-like poles being found right under the water surface directly under that little tower you're supposed to dive from at the lake. And black garbage bags filled with big rocks were found on the narrow bridge crossing the river, so that if a car had hit it, chances are it would have gone off the road and into the water. Long story short, someone out there in the woods was making human traps. And I just about ran into one. This happened about 20 years ago, when I was 16, but I remember it like it just happened because it freaked me out so badly. I've never seen anything like it before, and I wouldn't have believed it if somebody had told me the story, but I witnessed it myself and I have never been able to find a logical explanation. I was a huge boring nerd, and I still am, so I was lying in bed reading The Complete Idiot's Guide to Learning Latin. You can look it up online to see how it looks. Big orange and white book with black print, like textbook sized. I heard my mom call to me from the living room. So I sat up and glanced around for something to use as a bookmark, since I was always very careful with my books and refused to dog ear the pages. I didn't see anything handy, and my mom called for me again. So I knelt down next to my bed and carefully tented the book on the floor at a steep angle so the spine wouldn't take damage. Then I opened my door and walked out. Our house was a three bedroom, but not very big. When I walked out of my room, I turned left and went down the hallway past my brother's bedroom door, which was closed. He had a habit of pacing his room while he talked on the cordless phone, and I could hear him doing just that as I walked by. At the end of the hallway, I turned to look into the living room, but I didn't leave the hall. My mom was sitting on the couch with her boyfriend, and she looked over and asked if I knew where the remote was. I said I didn't, and she said, okay, so I walked back to my room. I was gone maybe 45 seconds at the max. I walked in, closed the door, and turned to walk over and pick up my Latin book, but there was nothing there. It was gone. It was so unexpected and impossible that I just froze. It was like my brain couldn't come up with any possible actions to take in this situation. So I just stood there, staring blankly. There were only four people in the house, one of which was me. My brother never left his room during those 45 seconds. I'd have heard his bedroom door open, and I'd have heard him stop talking. He has a very deep, rumbly voice. My mom and her boyfriend were getting ready to watch a movie in the living room. Even if one of them had tried to pull a weird random prank by taking my book, they wouldn't have had time to pull it off, unless they'd literally been running, which I would have seen and heard. And it's not like anyone could have broken in and taken it. The previous owners had been burglarized once, so they had a burglar bar installed on all the windows and doors. Our joking nickname for the house was Fort Knox. Besides, 
What thief would come in and steal a Latin book? All this was running through my mind while I stood there staring. After a few minutes, I decided my mind must be playing tricks on me. I know the human brain can ignore information right in front of it if it decides it isn't important for some reason, which is how we can miss seeing something in plain view. I was amazed to have an awareness of the phenomenon in real time, and I marveled over how strange the brain is. I started to slowly approach the spot on the floor while staring at it, wanting to see the moment when the book would appear to materialize there as my mind stopped being stupid. But it didn't happen. I thought, all right, well, my eyes are playing tricks on me, but my hands won't. And I crouched down and swept my hands across that spot on the floor where the book should be. I felt nothing, just the carpet. I was totally shocked because my mind is playing tricks was the only reasonable explanation that I'd had. And now that was out. Had I completely imagined the crystal clear memory of tenting the book on the floor? After a few more moments of staring and rubbing my hands all over the floor, I decided that was the only other possible explanation. I must have actually put the book somewhere else. I got up and proceeded to tear my room apart. I pulled blankets and pillows off the bed, combed through both of my bookshelves, opened desk drawers and dresser drawers, shook out clothing, even opened my closet and practically turned it inside out. Every few seconds I would stare back at that spot on the floor, but it was empty. After close to an hour of searching, I finally laid down to peer underneath my dresser. Nothing. Then I sat up, shaking my head in defeat. There was nowhere left to look. I glanced back one more time at the spot on the floor. The book was there, exactly where I thought it had been, tented just how I had left it. I froze up again, breathless, feeling like I had just been electrocuted. How the... After I unfroze, I gingerly picked it up and looked at the page it was open to. Same page that I'd been on when I put it down. It was as though the past hour had never happened, except that now my room was trashed. Where in the world did my book go? And how did it come back? This happened in mine and my husband's first house several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving nightlights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m., 
and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved, and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room, or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out, saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate, probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go, now, back to his mom's. Then we, somehow, just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. 
I remember laying there, sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit, before I am wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, Whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs, and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning, rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room, because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside, he's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not-scared-of-anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys and haven't really looked back other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit. Last Thursday, in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in, because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. 
However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. A couple of years ago, I experienced a moment straight out of the Truman Show. I was skiing on Whistler Mountain with my family. I'm a fast skier, so I usually will zip down the mountain and then wait for my dad to catch up with my phone in hand in case he needs to reach me. One run, I stopped about halfway down the mountain to wait for him to catch up and received a phone call from my dad. When I picked up, he didn't answer. Instead, I heard what sounded like radio chatter. I couldn't make out exactly what was being said, except for one thing. We lost him. Wait, wait, he stopped by the tree. Then the line went dead and my dad came skiing down. Not only was he not on his phone, but his phone was dead. I told my family about this and even had the phone call record in my recent phone calls as evidence that I had at least received a call when I claimed I did. What was especially strange is that my younger brother had a memory of the event as well. He said that I had skied to the bottom of the mountain where he was eating lunch and that I had received the call in front of him, but I didn't. He also told me the next morning that he had a nightmare that men in suits were standing all around his bed telling him to forget what he had seen and that, quote, he could never know the truth, he being me. He could have easily been messing with me, sure, but he seemed really shaken up at the time, like genuinely scared, and he's still fascinated by the events whenever I bring them up today. When this happened, it completely shattered my worldview about reality. I still find myself questioning what's real, it was a very strange event. I feel like I was never supposed to experience it. Like I said, it eerily reminds me of that scene in the Truman Show where his car radio is playing security radio chatter of them following him. I don't know what to make of it, but it was really, really strange. This happened when I was 16. My mother used to take my phone at night and then give it back to me when she woke me up for school the following morning. Every morning started the same. She would wake me up, I would go to the bathroom to take a shower and get ready, I'd come out and put on my uniform, she'd give me breakfast, and then I would run out of the house to catch the public bus. This is the important part. I would always take my phone into the bathroom with me. I'm the type of person who plans my day by the minutes. I knew I had to take my shower for X amount of minutes, get out of the bathroom by X, leave the house at X, etc. So the same routine. I was in the bathroom and I remember it so clearly. My shower took way longer than usual. And instead of it being 7.15 when I got out, the phone said 7.23. I remember rushing out of the bathroom as I was supposed to leave the house by 7.25 on most days. I rushed and put on my uniform, and my mom followed me half out of the house with my breakfast. I distinctly remember checking the clock before I left, too, trying to figure out if I had time to catch the bus or if I would have to take a car to school. The clock was at 7.28, so I did have time to catch the bus. It was a snowy day in January. I also remember that vividly. The sky was gray and dark, but that's how it was every day. The streets were eerily empty. I stood at my bus stop, which was on the side of a pretty busy street. Not today. No one was on the street. Maybe one car passed by every few minutes. I started to get worried that I would be late for school. 
and that's when I looked down at my phone to call my dad to see if he could drop me off. It was 4.03 in the morning. I was shocked. It couldn't be. I walked back home and my mom was still up getting my other sister ready for school. She was surprised to see me. I told her to check the time and to her surprise too, it was four o'clock in the morning. She started saying how she had sworn that her alarm woke her up at seven, like it does every single morning. We both looked at each other and just swore that we'd seen the time. A 4 a.m. snowy day and a 7 a.m. snowy day looked almost identical outside, but I know that I checked the clock enough times to confirm that it was in the seven o'clock hour. Regardless, we all went back to sleep and again I woke up at seven. This time I made my dad take me to school and the whole day I had my eyes on the clock. This incident never happened to me again, but I still have no explanation for it. I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal but it's really hard to tell what happened. In 2013, I worked as a baker at a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It's still in business. It was a super old building, and it had a reputation for being haunted, at least among the staff. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. So I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m., unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. 
we were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that the dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks that was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle managed to get on top of the tarp I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my coworkers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other coworker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal things and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about these things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of the cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words, and it had texture. It was like nothing I've ever heard before. It was like somebody was speaking from another dimension, almost filled with static. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio, because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me, but after finding no other explanation, I turned around to face her and said, What was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought it was you. We both froze in disbelief, and at the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. Neither of us could reach it. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on top of the espresso bar moving, so we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches in the air, wiggled a bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was so utterly in awe of what had just happened, I remember saying out loud, Okay, I get it now. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day, it remains the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I've ever witnessed. This all started after my dad died last October. We quickly moved in with my grandparents. We lived in California, but now we're in Arizona. Anyway, a few months after that, I went swimming there in the pool. My mom was out there talking to me, and then she went inside to get me a towel. While she was still inside, maybe five minutes later, I went underwater. But before my head went under, I saw the glimpse of a black silhouette. I came back up thinking that it was my mom, but I looked around and she wasn't there. She came back outside about ten minutes after that, and I told her all about it. She said that she had been seeing it too, but didn't tell me the specifics. The second and last time I saw it was the middle of last month. My mom and sister went back to California to get some of our stuff from the storage we have there. They've been gone two nights by this time. It was around 2.30 to 3.30 in the morning. I have insomnia, so I'm usually always up at this time. I was starting to get tired, and I dozed off at probably about 2.50. I was only asleep for about two minutes before I heard three loud-ass bangs on my door. I usually get jump-scared in my dreams by a fast movement, but never a loud noise, so I was pretty freaked out. I jumped up and looked around, but I didn't see anything. A few minutes later, I finally got the courage to get out of bed. I walked out of my room and I went down to the restroom across the hall. Before I got into the doorway, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the silhouette again. I looked back, but nothing was there. I don't usually get scared, but that night, holy crap, I was terrified. 
I talked to my mom and sister about it, and my sister said that she hadn't seen it. But like I said, my mom has seen it. My mom thinks it's my dad, but it doesn't even look like him. And why would he be trying to scare us? Why would he show up as a shadow instead of just himself? No one else that I know has seen it, though. If anyone knows what this is or has heard something like it, please tell me. So this happened 15 years ago to my brother and I, and I still can't come up with a satisfactory logical answer to explain our experience. For detail, this happened in Ontario, Canada, and we were eight and five. I was eight and he was five. It's a suburban area built around a medium-sized forest, and our house backs into the woods we were driving home with our mom, and we were arguing, so she told us to get out and work it out before we came home. She dropped us off in front of the woods at the playground. There's a connected public path leading back up through the woods to our street, it's about a five minute walk, and a small hill between the playground and the main road. We were not pleased that we got in trouble, so we made up quickly and started playing on the slide and the swings. My brother was up on the slide platform, and I was over on the swings when he called down to me. Who are those guys? I looked over and I saw two men dressed in black suits, white shirts, and black sunglasses coming over the top of the hill toward us. They were walking briskly and purposefully, right in our direction. They had brown hair, not close cropped but short and had fairly pale skin. It was beyond bizarre, and they scared me right away. I told my brother to come down the slide so we could go home. They had already unnerved him enough that he actually listened to me. We started down the path home, and when I looked over my shoulder, they were still coming toward us, walking quickly. That was horrifying, so I started to walk even faster too holding my brother's hand and pulling him along. Maybe 30 seconds later, I looked behind me again, and they had started to run toward us. They weren't sprinting, more of a jog, but they were bigger, so they were gaining on us fast. That pushed us over the edge into complete terror. I screamed at my brother to run home as fast as he could. I knew that he was a faster runner than me and I thought that he would be able to tell our parents if I ended up being kidnapped. I have honestly never run faster in my life, and we didn't look behind us again until we made it to our house. Our parents were still unloading the groceries, and were surprised when we ran up out of breath and on the verge of tears. They figured that we had gotten spooked on our own. After all, some guys in suits chasing us was a pretty weird story. The men never said a word. It was like a wall of silence had accompanied them. Neither of us have ever experienced anything like that again, and it wasn't until last year, when I watched a BuzzFeed Unsolved episode about Men in Black encounters, that I realized that was what we'd seen. Has anyone else had an encounter? Or does anyone have any theories about who those men could have been, if you don't believe in the Men in Black? To cut an extremely long story short, my friend used to live in a house that was well into the woods. One day, he told me something was happening around his house, so I spent the night. We sat with our backs to the wall, and the window cracked just a bit on the second story. As we were talking, we started hearing strange noises coming from the woods. We were shocked as we peeked to see what it could be. Between his house and the woods was a big open area. We could faintly see the open area because of the moonlight. 
but we couldn't see into the pitch blackness of the woods. Suddenly, some large white creature that looked like a naked man creeped out. It was bald, and its eyes were glowing. When we freaked out, I yelped a bit too loudly, causing it to stop and go back into the woods. The next day, being the curious people we were, we decided to go out into the woods and search. Eventually, we found a strange uprooted tree with a bunch of holes in the ground. We heard heavy breathing coming from somewhere inside, but we decided not to go in there looking. A few weeks went by and nothing. I came back to his house just to have a sleepover. He asked me to go grab one of his bikes off the back porch. I went back there through the garage, but as I was grabbing it, I felt like something was watching me. I looked off toward the woods, but saw nothing. Suddenly, I heard a strange noise literally over my head. I looked up at the roof, which was only about seven feet off the ground in that section of the house due to the elevation of the porch, and I saw a similar creature sitting on the roof just feet from my face. When I panicked, it shrieked in my face, and I ran back into the garage and slammed the door shut. My friend ran into the garage from inside the house to see what had happened, and I was panicking, telling him to lock everything. We locked ourselves inside and waited for his dad to come back. This was around six to eight o'clock at night. I don't remember exactly, but it was closer to the night. His dad was in the military and decided to step out and take a look after he came home and we told him what had happened. He saw that same creature in the distance, just on the edge of the woods but he had no explanation for us as to what it could be. It's been five years since that happened, and now I've been seeing sightings of things just like it all over the place. YouTube, Reddit, Facebook. It's really been haunting me lately, thinking back on that sound that it made when it shrieked and the way it looked. It was terrifying. Its eyes seemed very strange too. I kind of tied two and two together and figured that it must live beneath the ground somewhere and only come up when it's dark. Has anyone else witnessed anything like this? I'm a 28-year-old male who lives in British Columbia, Canada. This experience had happened when I was about nine years old. During the time, we used to live by a heritage site which was called the Pillith House. You can Google it if you want some more background. My family and pretty much the entire neighborhood used to refer to this house as the Creepy Doll House every time we drove by or spoke of it. This experience had happened on a windy, somewhat rainy fall day. I was sick that day, so my mom made me stay home, and I didn't have to show up to school. At the time, it was only my mom and I at home. I had two older sisters that were in high school, and my dad was at work. My mom used to sew clothes for a living and worked from home a couple of days during the week. Right outside the rear sliding door that exits to the backyard, we built a small shed, like a room area, where my mom could sew and store her sewing machine and supplies. She would be in there a couple of hours a day and would check up on me when it was time for lunch and things like that. On this particular day, it was a normal sick day for me, just like every other sick day. I woke up, had some cereal, and turned on the TV to watch some Barney while my mom was in the backyard sewing her clothes. The couch that I was on was facing the TV, so my head was turned to the left. In front of me was a black glass fireplace with a reflection where my two feet were facing. We also had a hallway that would lead up to the bedrooms where my head was pointing at. As I was watching Barney, I remember this pretty vividly. I noticed a dark figure with its knees bent, hunched over, 
and swaying side to side, with its arms bent out on the reflection of my fireplace. This figure continued its dancing for a couple of seconds, until I turned around to look down the hallway, and nothing was there. It was almost as if it was mimicking what Barney was doing on TV. I wasn't frightened because I thought it could have just been one of my siblings home for lunch or just screwing with me. I called out to my siblings by name, but nobody answered. I even ran down the hallway and checked out all the rooms, but again nobody was there. I ran out to get my mom and told her what happened, so we both came inside to look around, but the house was empty. But here's the strangest part. As we were coming out of the hallway, the front door slammed open, so I had to go downstairs and close and lock it. It was windy that day, but the door should have been locked. We didn't really think much of it, and just sort of brushed it off. Fast forward more than ten years later. By this time, we had already moved out. My sister had come to visit me and my parents, and we were talking over lunch. My sister had recently learned that her friend's dad works for the government, and was assigned to take care of and maintain the Pillith House. She only brought this up because, again, the Pillith House used to be right beside us. This would require him to stay a night, so he could wake up and do yard work. Apparently, he has had some frequent experiences in that house, such as random footsteps, knocking, but mostly someone jumping on his bed while he was trying to sleep. He was never bothered by it because it was so frequent it just seemed normal. He mentioned that there was the spirit of a little boy and a man in that house. As she was telling us this, I immediately connected the dots. I'm pretty sure I met the little boy, and I'm pretty sure he just wanted to play. So, a little backstory. My partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally go and visit him. I live in Scotland. So, I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. While we both are interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences. Whereas, he tends to just humor me, not believing much of it himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment, but I saw, heard, and felt small things the first couple of days I was there. One morning in particular, at around 4am, I was on the sofa, playing on my phone, dealing with jet lag, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to the shadow person phenomenon, just a dark humanoid shape, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned, almost as if it was startled to see somebody else in the room, never mind someone who could also see it. It did a sort of double take, and then disappeared, but the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I've come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy, with the exception of later that day, when I was taking a nap. I felt what I thought was my partner standing over me and watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and I felt the negative presence over me, as though trying to work out who I was and why I was there. I told it in very clear terms that it wasn't welcome, whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine. My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times, once to Jerome, and another to a recreation spot by a lake. I felt a little funny any time we were driving around or near or on the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us traveling through their land, but nothing felt bad, just sort of a curiosity. But one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix after a day at the lake, 
We were all chatting away in the car when we got into reservation territory. I got that not alone feeling again, but still, it was curious, though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation, and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down, when in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know he was Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anybody else had seen him, they all said no, despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, completely white, clothes, hair, and everything, with an aura of hazy light around him, simply standing watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. It was comforting. I don't really know why I'm telling anybody this, other than I felt that I needed a lighter story to go with the spookier one at the beginning. I hope you enjoyed, and if you've ever had similar experiences, I'd be happy to know about them. When I was 16 years old, I bought a one-way plane ticket to Edmonton, Alberta. My first real girlfriend had broken my heart and I needed to get away. School ended and I got on that plane. I ended up traveling and working all over northern Alberta, making forays into the Northwest Territory and northern British Columbia. I was living in a tent in high-level Alberta and working at Swanson's a local lumber mill on the dry chain pole. This involved grading lumber and stacking it as it came out from the sawmill. Mostly 2x material, spruce used in framing applications and things like that. I lived pretty simply and cooked over a fire. Wood was not an issue. For a refrigerator, I just dug down in the cold earth about three feet and made a lid with plywood and kept all of my perishables in there. It worked great. I worked with a lot of indigenous people. My foreman was a native, as were most of my co-workers. I grew fond of most of them. They would stop by my camp and check in on me from time to time. Even the foreman, who took me to a real bar for the very first time. This campsite had a hand-pumped well, where I would get my daily water from. It was maybe a hundred yards away from my tent, with a clear and worn path to follow. One morning in late July, I woke up, shook myself out of my sleeping bag, opened the tent door, and grabbed my water jug. I was far enough north that the night was short. I could read a book at 11 p.m. and not need any extra light other than what the sun provided. I proceeded up the path, and about halfway to the pump, I almost tripped over a guy who was laying on the ground. He was dressed in what I assumed to be traditional native garb, and had a fire going, right up against a tree, to reflect the heat back onto him. I said, oh, I'm sorry, almost didn't see you there. He looked at me and all he said was, white man use propane? I was a bit thrown off, but I pointed to his fire and said, kind of chuckling, no, no, I use wood for fires, just like you. He didn't say anything, but gave me the biggest smile and nodded. I went on my way, got my water, and started heading back. I got to the spot where I had seen the old man, but he was gone. The fire was gone too. I thought, well that's weird, and I went back to make sure that I wasn't missing him somehow. I knew I was right though. I felt the tree, and it wasn't even warm. I kicked some needles around, but there was absolutely no sign of a fire ever being there. No sign of a body laying down. Nothing. It was like he never existed. Like the fire never existed. The funny thing was, though, I wasn't really scared or freaked out, as he had seemed so benign. Like he was on my side. It's really hard to describe. I 
I recently moved from North Carolina to Vancouver Island, BC, Canada for work. It's truly beautiful here, and the lush, green, mossy forests of the Pacific Northwest are definitely something else. You have trails, woods, and parks everywhere here, so it's no surprise that there was a huge old-growth tree area two minutes away from my house. After a couple of weeks of settling in, it became a routine to walk my dog in these woods daily. I mean, at least until two days ago. I went for a walk with my dog fairly early in the morning, right after the sun rose. It was a typical walk for me, until my dog, who always loves to walk these woods, wouldn't move. It just stood still and barked toward a tree. As much as I tried to get him to move, he's a big dog, and it's hard to control him when he doesn't obey. At first I thought it must have been a squirrel, or a bird, but then I hear laughing coming from that direction. As far as I could see, there were no other humans nearby. But then, I see it. A little human-looking being quickly sprints through some ferns, no taller than 10 to 12 inches, seems pale green, a sort of moldish color. As far as I'm aware, it had some hairs, and it ran very fast. I didn't manage to get a photo of it or observe many details, as my dog's loud barking got distracting. After this, I didn't stay to investigate and quickly walked back home, and luckily, my dog followed along. I no longer feel safe in those woods. And if anybody knows what that could have been, help is very much appreciated. I know what I saw. I assume that I'm going to be called delusional, and I guess I would most likely say the same if someone told me this story. But everything that I said is exactly what I saw. When I was a kid, years ago, we heard stories of a little ghost boy that haunted my grandparents' place. Stories of how they would hear my cousin's toys moving around at night, or find his tricycle not where it was left. My uncle was renovating the basement one day by himself, and was going back to the house with some lumber. He looked up at the house, and the little boy was looking at him through the window. One day, when I was about 11 or 12, it would be my turn. I was in the kitchen eating a sandwich and drinking a pop, and my little cousin was about 6 to 7. He was drawing on a piece of paper on the floor. His back was to the basement stairs, and he was crouched over his drawing. I was watching him, and all of a sudden, a little boy of about 4 years old comes tiptoeing up the stairs. He stood behind my cousin and was leaning over him, watching him draw. When he was doing this, he had his hands behind his back, leaning. Then he turned and looked at me, smiled, and ran down the hallway. When he got to the bathroom, he disappeared. I remembered that he was bow-legged and pigeon-toed by the way his feet swept back when he ran. Also, he wore tight blue jeans that went above his ankles navy blue socks, and a striped tight t-shirt. I am a Native American from Alberta, Canada, and this little boy was Caucasian. We heard stories about an old man and a little boy that were buried in the unmarked graves nearby. The land before we lived there was used to travel to a trading post that used to be near us. I bet it was him. Poor little guy. He used to be just a baby before he passed. My grandparents were eventually tired of the stories, and they prayed over the home, and we've never seen him again. In the fall of August 2013, I was set to begin my first semester at Arizona State University in Tempe, and I had to attend an orientation in the middle of campus. After making the 30-minute drive earlier than anticipated, 
My grandma pulled into the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church, where we exchanged conversation for about 15 minutes to kill time. There was a gardener in front of us tending the flowers, and only one black sedan parked directly next to us that I hadn't noticed earlier when we pulled in. As we unceremoniously prepared to get out of the car, something caught my grandma's eye in her periphery as she reached for her seatbelt button in the direction of my passenger seat. She quickly gasped, placing her right hand on her chest as she chuckled and then quipped, Wow, I thought I saw a ghost. Looking directly at her without turning as she let out another nervous chuckle, I asked her what the hell she was talking about. The parking lot at this point was dead silent, and the gardener was busy tending the flowers in the building opposite the church. Not expecting much, I slowly and nervously turned to my right, where the four-door black sedan was parked to the right of us, only to come in direct eye contact with what appeared to be a woman of Asian heritage, with a bob haircut and a pinstripe suit business attire, staring at us for no discernible reason. With the dead stare she was giving us, it could be assumed that she'd been staring for longer than we had noticed her. What made this individual terrifying was the lack of life in her eyes. I only looked for what felt like five seconds but could feel that glassy, uncanny valley, lights are on but nobody's home kind of corpse appearance. The color of this entity's skin was a pale color that I could only associate with a corpse at the time. Her mouth moved slowly and developed into one of the most unsettling half-smiles I've ever seen as her dead eyes looked at my grandma and I, unwavering. In this deafening silence, my grandma and I turned back to each other, chuckled uncomfortably, and slowly got out of the car, refusing to look at the terrifying entity or the person in the car next to us. While my grandma claims that she forgot about this incident, she believes it probably did happen whenever I tell her about it. If anybody can help me with identifying this type of entity, or if you've seen something similar, I would really be appreciative. I know that certain areas of Tempe are haunted, and the campus as well, but I couldn't find any information on an incident like this. I live on the west coast of British Columbia in Canada, about midway up the coast. I was driving my girlfriend back to her granddad's house, two towns over from mine. It's about a two and a half hour drive on the highways. I had driven her home and spent the day visiting her family. The town she is from is right on the coast. It's a port city. Not super important, but the point is that I spent the day there and was now getting ready to drive back home. About 25 to 30 minutes into the drive, I'm on the highway that runs parallel to the mouth of the river on one side, and the CN tracks on the other. So it goes rail on my left, the road I'm on, and then sort of a mini channel where the river ends. I'm driving and it's getting dark, but I'm not tired or drowsy at all. There's a few rest stops along the road on my right, on the riverbank. I had to pee, so I started slowing down at the first one, and that's when some thing scurries across the road. And that's almost all that happened. It was four-legged, at least from what I saw, and it was the blackest of black, like unnaturally dark. No texture or anything to it. It almost looked like a void of light or color in the shape of this thing. It ran out of the bush, over the rails, and I was going slow enough that the wind and highway noise was gone, and I heard it. It sounded like metal tapping as it ran over the ballast and the rail, and then there was the sound like if you took a rod of rebar or something and stabbed it into the ground, then metal again as it ran right in front of me across the road. Its body was shaped like how some people describe a UFO almost flat and disc-like, 
like an oval stretched out with the legs protruding from the front and the back. It had no features, no eyes, no face, no mouth, nothing that I could see. It ran across the road, limbs outstretched as it ran, and then it ran into the rest area and over the bank and I'm guessing into the river. This thing was huge. I'm talking like the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Very big and very fast. I've tried searching this online, but I haven't had any luck. If anyone can help me figure out what I saw, please let me know. This isn't exactly a horrifying story, so don't get too disappointed if you're not terrified. For background, I'm a 15-year-old Irish fella called Ross. I go to school in Ireland, and I'm now in third year. At the start of the second year, I knew a fella that joined the school. I was in charge of showing him around, and we've been good friends ever since. He is Portuguese, and his name is Tiago. I'll call him Tig for the story. His school bag is a fairly small, bright red bag. He's a little bit shorter than me, and his hair is quite short and brown in color. One day, I was upstairs in my school. It was break time, and I was going to my group's usual spot. I turned a corner, and I saw Tig walking along the hallway. This was weird, because at the distance I was from him, I would have seen him come up the stairs. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I sped up to catch up to him. There was another corner coming up. He rounded it and I followed suit, except he wasn't there. There was a staircase going back down and two bathrooms, one for lads and one for lassies, but no Tig. Considering how close behind him I was, he would have had to have sprinted towards and then jumped down the stairs or jogged into one of the bathrooms. If he went for the stairs, I would have heard it so I figured he was in the bathroom. I sat at the bench and waited. Tig was the first other person in our group to arrive. He rounded the corner and sat his bag down. The realization hit me hard. He wasn't in the bathroom, and whatever or whoever I had followed was not Tig, even though it looked just like him. Same backpack and everything. I asked him if he had already been up there, to which he replied he hadn't. He had no reason to lie. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was someone else. First of all, the person that I saw looked the exact same as my friend from the back. Second of all, no one else in the school has that bag. At least I've never seen anyone else with it. And third, the only place the person could have gone without sprinting down the stairs, which I probably would have caught a glimpse of anyway, would be the bathroom. No one ever came out of the bathroom. At least nobody that I didn't watch go into it. Finally, my friend is a fairly distinct character. Not many people have the same body build as he does. Like I said at the start, it's not exactly terrifying, but I do believe it to be a glitch in the Matrix. I've never thought about glitches in the Matrix as a serious thing, until I started reading more about them. All this time, I've blamed my weird experiences on ghosts. Though I've never seen one, I still believe in them, since my experiences are, at least to me, still unexplainable. I moved into my current house six years ago. It's almost a hundred years old, in the oldest neighborhood in my very large city. Weird things would happen, but we would just shrug it off. You know, lights flickering when we would tease each other about ghosts, things falling off the shelves and out of the cabinets, things going missing and then reappearing in weird places, or by weird means. And then, these three events happened. 1. Our living room TV remote disappeared for two years. Then, one afternoon, I was sitting on the couch, 
picking up little play balls and throwing them to my toddler. I went to pick up another ball, and right in the middle of the ball pile was the remote. It wasn't there when I made the ball pile. I still thought that maybe somehow the toddler had put it there, but I really don't think so. Number two. I used our garden hose, which has a very specific cap on it. I was done with the hose, wound it back up, turned it on to wash my hands off, turned it off, capped it, and walked away. As I was walking away, my roommate walked to the hose and immediately asked where the cap was. I turned, walked the several feet back to the hose, and sure enough, that cap was gone. Not on the ground, not in the bushes, nowhere. I still just thought that maybe somehow it got lost, but that doesn't make a bit of sense. I had just put that cap back on a few seconds before, and nobody else had walked up in that amount of time. Last, but definitely not least, the weirdest incident that actually made me believe it was a ghost was this. I was sitting on one side of the couch, and my roommate was on the other side. He started the movie that we were going to watch. I had an ashtray and a lighter sitting next to me. I put everything down right where it was supposed to go, and then leaned the lighter onto the ashtray. A few minutes later, I went to get it again, but the lighter was gone. I figured maybe it slipped between the couch cushions or went somewhere else, but nope. We took all the cushions off, and it wasn't there. My roommate picked the entire couch up, and nothing was underneath it. The lighter just vanished. I ended up having to use a book of matches. After the movie, I went to bed, but I left everything else, minus the lighter, on the couch. I woke up the next morning, but where I had left my matches was my lighter, laying right in its spot. At first, I was like, let's be reasonable here, and called my roommate. He said that he didn't find or see the lighter, but he remembers the matches because he used one in the morning before he left for work and put them right next to the ashtray. Ever since then, I was convinced that there was a ghost in my house, but maybe these are glitches in the matrix. What do you think? When I was a young child, about 10 or 11, I moved into a small country town. I've been there before, and my parents grew up there. Everyone who lives there knows that the whole town is haunted, from the school and even the church hall to everything else. And once it goes dark, most people who live there go inside because you can see spirits walking in dark places, and that's pretty much the extent of it. But the house that I lived in had a spirit who likes to mimic voices, specifically of your loved ones, and even likes to look like them. It would only target me and my older sisters, and only when we were home alone. I would wake up with bruises and scratches, same as my sister. One time I was home alone and heard my older sister call out for me from our room. I got up and saw her walk into our room just slightly, but I could tell it was her. I called her name, but she didn't answer, so I followed her in. I entered our room and saw that it was empty. I thought that she was messing with me, but she's pretty tall, so there wasn't really anywhere she could hide. Then, suddenly, I heard the front door open. I went and saw my older sister, with the rest of my family, coming home. She hadn't been there. This wasn't the first time that something like this happened, and it certainly wasn't the last. Fortunately, I moved out of there about two years ago, and I've never woken up with a random bruise or scratch ever again. I write in a daily journal, 
and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017, Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, the first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours. Was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st. Husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, 
objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in Old House, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, Good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. So when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large century house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV. Except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. 
I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it. And as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me, so much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there. For a few years, at least. Then, after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could sense supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night, hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me. And while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal. So I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard, and I saw out of the corner of my eye my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. 
As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off, and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again, and the current residents have stayed there the longest. My wife and I bought our house almost three years ago. The very first night while we were there, we were laying in bed about to fall asleep when we heard a loud knock on the kitchen floor. It was like something very heavy had fallen. We jumped out of bed to find nothing. We hadn't even unpacked anything. Over the next few weeks, we would hear the doors in our basement open and shut. Several times I would get up and go down to the basement to see if anything was out of the ordinary, but nothing would ever be out of place. We have a completely finished basement, and it's not creepy or anything like that. Over time, activity would mellow out and then ramp back up again. My wife and I would both, on occasion, catch somebody standing in the kitchen as we walked by the kitchen door. But when we did a double take, nobody would be there. Most of the activities that we experience take place during the day, so I don't think it's just us being spooked by the dark or something. My children have had many strange occurrences too. I was in the kitchen one day, and my son was sitting on the stairs to the basement. He jumped up and ran to me, saying, the bad man's in the basement. I asked, where? And he replied, at the bottom of the stairs. Being a rational adult and not wanting our three-year-old to be afraid, I decided to walk him down and show him that there was nothing to be afraid of. We found no one. A couple of weeks later while I was at work, my wife and kids were home alone. My wife was in the bedroom and my son in the living room playing trains. All of a sudden, my kid screams and runs into my wife shouting, the bad daddy is in the kitchen. My wife looked, but nobody was there. Sometime later, my wife and kids and I were in the living room watching TV while the kids played. Both my son and daughter stop at the exact same time, look at the kitchen, and follow something there with their eyes down the hall into a bedroom, back down the hall and through the kitchen. We were sitting there watching both of them track the same thing that we couldn't see. Another time, the four of us were in the kitchen planting seeds for our garden in the little seed starter trays, when our daughter stops and looked at the doorway to the basement. She smiled and said, Are you playing in the basement? She was two at the time, and spoke clear as day to somebody that we could not see. Other times, we would hear our kids talk to somebody when they were in their rooms completely alone. One Sunday morning, while watching football, I was sitting on the couch with my back to the bedroom door, which was open. I decided to get up and make some breakfast. The door was open when I walked into the kitchen. When I came back, the door was closed. I thought it was odd, but I just sat back down and continued to watch the game. After a while, I got back up to go to the bathroom, and I noticed that the door was opened halfway. When I returned to the living room, it was shut again. The rest of the day, I sat in the chair adjacent to the couch so that I could have a full view of the door. We've had many strange encounters. These are just the few that I can think of off the top of my head. The activity seems to be picking up again, and my wife wants to sage again. I try to be rational and remind her that this is a 70-year-old house. There will be noises. But as a skeptic, I find it hard to be skeptical with the amount of activity we have here. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent, because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just going to start from the beginning. 
This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. And I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently, everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November, 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. 
I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done, that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense, things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard. And now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me. 
where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. I remember when I was a kid that every school was built over a cemetery. It was cliche. But my elementary school actually was built over one. Ever since I was a little girl, I was heavily interested in the paranormal, and I always thought my school had something weird going on. For some reason, I was invested in proving to myself that I was right. In the fourth grade, my experiments began. I purposefully stayed later in my classroom, hoping something would happen. I was always alone for like 10 minutes every day in the classroom, and I waited for like five minutes in silence to hear something. I was slowly getting frustrated and decided to drop my experiments. But one day, it happened. I was alone in my classroom putting some things away in my locker space as quickly as possible so I could join my friends on the patio. My classroom was at the end of the hallway on the second floor, so I was rushing to catch up. I could hear the muffled voices of the other kids outside. In one instant, it was like a crowd of people talking out loud just hit me in the ears. I couldn't understand a bit of what they were saying, but it was loud. Louder than a bunch of kids playing outside. I grabbed my backpack and ran outside. When I was just by the stairs, I closed my backpack and walked to meet my friends. I was freaked out, but I didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't want a bunch of other kids to stay late in the classroom with me, and if someone told a teacher, they would think I was doing it for attention. Some weeks passed and I wasn't staying late anymore because I didn't want to hear those voices again. One day, I thought it would be interesting to leave a piece of paper with a message for the ghosts hidden behind my books. I made sure nobody was there and that nobody could see it in plain sight. Sure enough, I received answers written on the paper. They were simple sentences, yes or no answers. Since my mom was a teacher at my school, I was the first kid to arrive at the classroom before anybody else would come in. I would open my message and I would see the answer. Eventually I stopped doing that because something about it just felt wrong and I could tell that the ghosts or whatever they were, were getting a bit annoyed. It wasn't much, but it was enough that it made me believe in ghosts and made me think that I was as awesome as the ghost hunters on TV. I had two friends named James and Sarah. Their basement was super creepy and a lot of weird things happened there. This is one of them. It was a random summer night just like any other, with the exception of some of the hauntings they had experienced getting more frequent and bolder, I guess you could say. James was watching TV downstairs while Sarah was taking a shower upstairs. While James was watching TV, he saw what he thought was smoke, but it was in the shape of a person. It passed right between him and the TV. He didn't really give it much thought and assumed he was just seeing things. A few moments later, he heard a shriek and then what sounded like somebody running down the stairs, but only stepping on about every third step. It was Sarah, wearing only shorts and a sports bra. 
she bolted out of the house into her mom's house, which was the house in the front of the lot. James chased her to find out what was wrong. She finally calmed down and said, I finished my shower and I was laying on my back, playing on my phone. My feet were dangling off the edge of the bed. I thought I heard the bedroom door creak open a bit. I thought it was you, but no one was there. That's when I felt somebody grab my ankles and try to pull me off the bed. That's why I ran out of the house. They did not stay in the house that night. Sarah actually had bruises around her ankles in the shape of fingerprints. That house is creepy. They told me that at any given time in the night, you can hear people talking in the empty rooms. Shadow people peer around the doorways. Things move or disappear randomly all the time. James even caught a picture once of that smoke while there was nothing in the room. In one of the pictures, the smoke even has a face. I've no idea what's going on in that house, but I don't know how they live there. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Etal, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single room all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway, I remember almost feeling as though I had walked into a wall of sorts, of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing her. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that the wing of the hotel was odd at least. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about 2 a.m., I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming dark shape was visible. It was darker than the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only to find that absolutely nothing was there. The window was locked from the inside. There was nobody in the closet or in the bathroom, and my room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned the light on, there was nobody there. It was just such a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I didn't get to experience anything after that. But I think I'm all right with that, because it still freaks me out to this day. In the home that I live in, there are multiple floors, and when I sleep in my normal bedroom, beneath the floor under the attic, I don't care if my door is open or closed, but I hate when I have to go to sleep with the door to the staircase up to the next floor open. I just don't want it that way. It feels wrong. There's also a bedroom where the floorboards creak every night. I'm always first with going to sleep, so there's plenty of light and relatives passing by. What kind of feels like a safe haven? Well, one time I was renovating my room, and I had to sleep on the floor beneath the attic. Basically, the stairs go up to a large room, from where every other room can be accessed. You always need to go through this room to get to it. This room is also the entrance to the attic. 
I never liked leaving a lit room after dark when I'm on my own. I even heavily dislike entering the house when nobody's on the ground floor. Luckily, you can just activate a time switch on the staircase that switches off the light located there. 10 minutes. And use this light to get to the room where I had to sleep in. I would activate the light switch there and close the door. So I was in there, and when I wanted to go to sleep, I would leave the door open a bit. I have a cat, and he often comes in at night to sleep on my bed. That's the reason that the door to the staircase has to stay open. I opened the door, switched off the light, put the cover in front of my window, which my mom told me to do, and went to sleep. The room was pitch black with that cover on. I'm lying in bed, just like normal, and suddenly I felt terrified. There was no real reason for it. I was just thinking about some random stuff that didn't scare me at all. And then I just froze like I couldn't move anymore. And that's when I heard breathing. At the same rhythm of mine, but coming from a corner. I held my breath, but the other breathing continued. I jumped up and felt my way to the door with my eyes closed. I switched the light on and closed the door. And I just sat there. Asking for another bedroom wasn't an option, so after about a half an hour... I decided to try again with the door closed, while repeating in my head that it was just the wind. I didn't hear the breathing sound again, though the wind sounded very similar. At the third night, I forgot the covers, and the window started creaking, like something heavy was on the wood around it. Eventually, it stopped and I could sleep like usual. But I had a really bad feeling every time that I turned those switches off and hurried to bed. And I would take any other bedroom as long as it wasn't on that floor. It's like the closer I sleep to the attic, the worse I feel. In the summer of 2020, my friends Alex and Violet and I decided to go on a mountain vacation. COVID cabin fever had hit us hard and we were desperate to get out. We settled on a mountain estate and planned to camp and hike at several different locations. For one night, we thought it would be fun to book a cabin in the woods. Violet's parents had rented a fire tower once and loved it but a cabin beside a fire tower wall was all we could find. It was cheap, clean, and secluded. Excited to have a night where we could be as obnoxious as we wanted, we booked it. In the weeks leading up to the trip, we decided that it would just be a great idea to drop acid at the cabin. Violet bought an entire sheet in preparation for our arrival, and it was tucked into her bag as we pulled out of the driveway to make our way to the cabin. I remember having this unusual knot in the pit of my stomach, this aching feeling that gnawed at me. I told Alex and Violet that there was no way we could drop acid that night. Violet was pissed. We turned around and got into a massive argument, but I stood my ground. I just knew that we had no business doing that that night. Couldn't explain it, I just knew. Finally, the fireworks settled and we were off. The cabin was roughly 30 minutes away from the nearest town. It sat atop a mountain. We held our breath as we rounded the busted road that spiraled toward the top. There were no pull-offs, no other campsites. Just a long winding road that led us to the cabin at the peak. We settled in and started a fire to keep warm. As dusk gave way to night, we heard the unmistakable noise of an engine on the road, then the flash of headlights. A side-by-side -side with three kids arrived, and our nerves settled. They smiled, gave us a wave, climbed the fire tower, and left. We had heard that there may be occasional visitors to the fire tower, but they were the only ones who had come by. We doused the fire and moved inside, heated some hot dogs until they were lukewarm, ate them fast, and sat in the silence. 
You don't know how quiet it is until you're in the middle of nowhere. You can hear every rustle of the leaves, the whisper of the wind through their branches. You get so used to white noise living in the city. There's always the hum of an air conditioner or the dim roar of traffic to focus on. Here, the closest thing to white noise was the sound of our own breathing. We jumped at every noise, too frightened to speak to one another. And finally, I had had enough. I cracked a few wine coolers, passed them to Alex and Violet, and then slapped a board game down on the table between our bunk beds. It didn't take long for us to loosen, and we were laughing, having the raucous good time that we had envisioned. Much soberer than we'd thought, but still, it was enough that we were able to ignore the rumble of the woods. Later, we'd all recall hearing noises in the background, the snap of a twig, the dim rumble of an engine. None of us wanted to rupture the air of nonchalance between us, so we had all collectively ignored it. Until a human hand reached up to the window between us and slapped it three times. We were screaming in an instant. Alex called 911, put them on speakerphone, and handed his cell to me. He grabbed pokers from the fireplace and passed them out. Violet started calling family members and saying her last goodbyes. I held my breath and listened for any more noise. Whoever this was, whatever this was, would have had to have heard us call 911. And now they were being careful to make a silent retreat. Dispatch arrived 20 minutes later, a lucky thing for a 1 a.m. emergency call, and had their dogs comb the mountain. Nothing. They suggested that it may have been a bear, but I could tell from their faces that they didn't believe that for a second, neither did we. We'd barely cooked those hot dogs, and why would a bear smack the window by a couple of screaming kids, rather than the one closest to the pan that we had used to cook? Why would the bear knock on the window like a human? And why, when we screamed, did the bear make a stealthy retreat? They had no answers, but they had one anecdote. As they had sped to us, they had come across a car at the base of the mountain, but that was the only life that they had seen. I remember my blood ran cold, but Violet and Alex were too frazzled to absorb the weight of what they had said and dizzied by a new horror. Violet's car, thoroughly dusted by our drive up the mountain, was covered in handprints. Handprints that didn't match ours, that touched places we hadn't. We grabbed our things by the armful and threw it inside, eager to remove every part of ourselves from this mountain. We followed the police, grateful that every pothole found us farther and farther from that wretched cabin. We made it down in record time, and found lodging at a seedy hotel that reeked of cat pee. I couldn't sleep. The thought of that car on the road rang in my head. Remember, there was nothing else on that mountain. It was a narrow road to the top. No pull-offs, no other campsites. There was the fire tower. Maybe a visitor decided to spook us during their late night excursion. But the kids from earlier, we had seen their headlights. Whoever did this had stopped their vehicle farther down the road and then hiked the rest of the way. They didn't want to be spotted. They wanted silence and secrecy. Whoever this was hadn't been looking for a cheap scare. They had planned it. I don't think I'll ever know what the person on the mountain wanted from us. I don't know if it was a practical joke or the beginning of a night of terror. I'm grateful for Alex's quick wit in calling 911. I wonder if our visitor knew that we had service. It had certainly been a welcome surprise to us. Perhaps that was a wrench in the plan, enough to spook the person before they could make things ugly. In truth, I don't know if I want to know. I'm just really glad that nothing else happened and that we were able to get off that mountain. A few years ago in college, I was on a dance team. 
Every fall we would hold auditions, and a new girl would join the team. Her nickname to me is Panda, so that's what I'm going to call her for this story. She was really nice, but I also didn't think much of it, as she was just an acquaintance at this point. Anyway, I was going through some dark shit in college, and I was journaling one day. I remember specifically writing a line like, I don't want to be here anymore, and I don't know what to do about it. Immediately after writing that, Panda's name popped into my head. It's almost like it was implanted in my head, rather than a thought that came from the conscious me. I wrote her name with a question mark after it. I didn't really know what to think. It was entirely random to me. At this point, I hadn't known her well enough to assume that she'd been going through anything. I wasn't sure what made me write her name down after that statement, but I moved along with my journaling. Later that same day, our dance team met at a party, and I could tell that something was off with her. Based on the weirdness of journaling earlier that day, I felt compelled to pull her aside and ask what was wrong. It turns out she was struggling with self-harm, which I could entirely relate to based on my past. I was taken aback. That's a weird enough coincidence. But what really floored me is that right after she admitted that to me, she said, I don't want to be here anymore, and I don't know what to do about it. It was the exact sentence I had written in my journal with her name next to it with a question mark. I guess it could be considered a common statement, and I know that it's not the craziest glitch in the matrix if that's even what it is, but I'm also not somebody that expects things like this to happen to me. I know the universe is weird, but my life feels very average and normal. What are the chances that I would write something down like that with her name next to it, hours before it was said to me, accurately predicting who was going to say it? Ultimately, she and I ended up becoming best friends, and it was that day that made all the difference. But it still weirds me out to this day. This wasn't anything mind-blowing, but it happened to me earlier today and it made me so confused. I live in an apartment building and the ground level is like a communal public space. I was taking the lift down from my apartment level to this ground level to exit the place in the morning. The lift doors have transparent panels so you can look out of the lift. And because of how lifts usually slow down when they're reaching the destination floor and the doors sometimes take a few seconds to open, I had a good 10 seconds to look at what was happening at the public space in the ground floor. From what I saw, there were three men mopping the floor, and one old lady, who I know is my neighbor, was walking across the space in front of these three men. But when I was in the lift, I noticed that all four of them were frozen. But it was weird, because they weren't just standing in casual positions. The men looked like they had just frozen as they were mopping, and the old lady was literally mid-stride. I spent a good three or four seconds wondering what was going on as I waited for the lift doors to open. But the moment the lift doors opened and I stepped out, everyone started moving. The men went back to mopping the floor, and the lady continued walking again. It was so odd, though, because it literally looked as though somebody had pressed play on them when I stepped out of the lift. It was so weird to me. I have no idea what happened. To start off, I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching, was six to seven feet tall, and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. To top things off, my cat saw it, 
definitely because the cat reacted. So I go get my Gatorade because ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him. Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So, being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for around two weeks each to stay. I loved it. The smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but it also brings back horrifying memories. The ranch is located in Florida not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. Shortly after, the owners started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history as well as an unfortunate side in the front of the house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before. The land has several different ponds and trails, which made for awesome adventures. I had a lot of fun, until my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At the time, I had no idea what made this pond so interesting. But later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound at the center of the pond, around 45 feet from the shore. It was perfectly centered. From my understanding, somebody was buried at the center of this pond. Not sure if this is true, mostly stories and no real evidence. But anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I grabbed my small bait caster sized rod and began to hook a worm by the hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone as I thought it would raise my chance of catching something. But that day, something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in it. I felt like a man with my rubber boots like my old man. About 20 minutes or so later, I noticed my bobber was going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So, in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in, and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. I'm not sure if this made sense, but it felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed as though nothing had ever been on it in the first place. Even the worm was still hanging off the hook. Feeling proud, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line. This is where things got crazy. About a foot away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock. I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg. It hurt like hell. 
As I realized what had just happened, I went to pull my left leg forward, but I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around with my butt now in the water. I started to scream, yelling for my father. It was as if my scream fell on deaf ears. I was being pulled into the water by something. I didn't feel hands or anything actually on my foot. It's just that my leg was not free and I was gradually going farther and farther into the water. I was screaming bloody murder at this point and after about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my foot let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father, screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come to me when I was screaming? My father, now shaking because of what I looked like, said, son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't see you from the other side. I'm calming down a little bit at this point and I ask him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, he just shrugged it off and said that my imagination had gotten the best of me. I never fished on that property again. Nobody actually believes it happened. They all tell me that I was caught on something or I made it up or it was all in my head. And I know that this is something that sounds outlandish, but something that I couldn't see had me that day and it wanted me. I'm not here to convince anybody, just to share. When I was a kid, when I was a kid in the 90s, I would often sleep at my grandmother's house in the middle of a small village in the Jura region of France. The bedroom I would stay in was called the room in the back. As the name suggests, it was one of the last two rooms at the end of a main corridor shaped like an L. There wasn't anything special about that bedroom. It was pretty small and contained a bed, shelves with books and some other very basic furniture. Yet for some reason, that room creeped me out I felt an unwelcoming presence, and I would always struggle to fall asleep, scared of whatever invisible forces seemed to be lurking in the dark. One night there, when I was around eight years old, I woke up scared and confused. I found myself lying down on the floor and in total darkness. I feel like I need to make two things clear here. This is the only time in my entire life that I have ever awakened outside of whatever bed or couch I'd been sleeping in. Second, despite the fact that the house is located in a small village, it wasn't particularly isolated, and the street lights outside would always let a little bit of light filter through the closed blinds at night. So here I was, a child, surrounded by total obscurity, struggling to understand why I wasn't in my bed, I tried my best to stay calm and touched around me, hoping to find the side of the bed nearby so I could climb back into it, but I simply could not find it. I tried for several minutes, but it just didn't seem to be there, which was extremely strange considering that the bedroom wasn't that big in the first place. I therefore decided to move forward in a single direction to find a wall, and then I could follow that wall until I found the bed. But things got even stranger as I tried to find a wall. I would bump into furniture that I didn't recognize, and despite all of my efforts, I could not find a wall anywhere. Everything around me was completely and utterly unfamiliar. I thought about calling for help. My grandmother was sleeping in the bedroom on the other side of the corridor, and my parents in the living room. However, I imagined them finding me screaming on the floor and decided not to, not wanting to face that kind of embarrassment. Finally, I fell asleep on the floor, giving up on finding the bed. The next morning, I woke up in that bed under the blankets, 
It was like the entire event had been nothing more than a weird dream. Yet it absolutely did not feel like a dream. I am a natural lucid dreamer, and even back then I was already very familiar with how dreams feel, and this just wasn't one. A few years ago, a long time after this strange occurrence, I went to England to visit my aunt, who's from the other side of the family. She claims to be a witch and is into a lot of new age stuff. I've always been skeptical, but I have to admit that she's done and said a few strange things that got me to go from not believing her at all to being a little bit more neutral about it. We were talking about our respective families, and she went on about the only time when she had ever been to my grandma's house when I was a baby. I thought it was a good opportunity to see if she had sensed anything unusual there, and I asked her, making sure to keep the question open so as not to influence her. The first thing she said was, ah, yes, the room in the back. She said it in English and had no idea that we called it that way in French too. There is something wrong with that room, she said. I was spooked. Once I got back to France, I decided to confront my mother about it since she'd spent her childhood in that house. As soon as I asked her what was wrong with that room in the back, she froze and her face became white. She explained to me that when she was little, she went into that bedroom with a few friends and they tried to invoke spirits for fun. They sat down on the floor in a circle, holding hands and said, spirit, if you're here, knock three times. They immediately heard three very violent knocks and ran off screaming. She told me that ever since then, the room had felt weird. That's it. Nowadays, the room is pretty different, but still used as a guest bedroom. It still feels weird, but I'd say a lot less so than when I was a kid. I know my brothers, who are 10 years younger than I am, have also complained about feeling uncomfortable there for some reason, but they never had any unusual experience there. Just a feeling. When my husband and I first married, we lived towns apart due to work. We also had a toddler. We decided to move in together as quickly as possible and went house hunting. I have always enjoyed stories of supernatural or paranormal occurrences, and I joked about how much I would love a haunted house. I was later told by a clairvoyant that the universe delivers. We finally settled on a house that was in our price range. It was built in the 80s, so no concern of lead paint, and not a lot of historic value either. Everything went smoothly, for the most part. Our toddler would awaken in the middle of the night and explain that her stuffed animals would move or fly. We figured she just wanted to sleep with us. Moving was a big transition for such a youngster. We got pregnant with another kiddo quickly, and he went out of country for about a year for work. Things were normal for the most part. The baby, six to 12 month age range, would sometimes stare at the front door and cry or point behind me when I was doing dishes. I didn't think it was too weird. My husband returned and I eventually decided to remodel the house. It had not been updated since being built. It was a major undertaking. My youngest was probably two years old at this point and the oldest was six. I became convinced that our house was haunted at this point and continued to be convinced for about two years. It's hard to remember the time frames for everything, but I will describe the activities that occurred during this two to three year period. I had a dog who required medication twice daily. It would frequently go missing. I would later find it in the same spot that I always kept the medication. One of my daughters would talk about the little boy that lived in the closet and that she was afraid of him. So we moved the two girls into the same room because we felt that they were perhaps lonely. This gave my husband a room to dedicate to his man cave and online PC gaming. My husband would talk about seeing a shadow dart back and forth in the hallway. 
I had a dream that when we took down the sheetrock, we found a secret room with dead twins who warned us to get out. All of this stuff seemed like normal occurrences that happen in life. But then I finally became convinced that the house was haunted. My children and husband were all in bed. I had clean laundry waiting to be folded on the chase, but decided to sprawl out on the couch and watch the breakfast club instead. Alone time was rare. All of a sudden, a shirt flew from the chase and hit me in the face. I ran to the bedroom and my husband was asleep. I woke him up and he said that he didn't believe me, but I know better because he got really anxious and couldn't sleep after that. The next big event occurred when my youngest told me that there was a man in her bathroom. We had a security alarm, so I knew that that couldn't be true. I had her take me to the bathroom and show me. She described him as being all black and pointed and said, he's right there. He's right behind you. I told her we would just leave him alone and go about our day. We had other things happen that we just explained away. I woke up to a shadow figure hovering over my husband. My dogs would wake up in the middle of the night and bark at the foot of the bed. I would hear noises coming from the kids room and get a terrible feeling whenever I would go and check on them. I sometimes had to walk through a cold mist to get to their room. My dogs would also sometimes bark in the hallway. I finally called someone to intervene when my husband met me at our door, freaking out. I worked weekends and I would always come home and tell him about my day while he played on his computer. The kids would be in bed by this time. I would then go and shower and go to sleep. This night, my husband said that I had already been home and talked to him about my day. I had then told him that I was going to go shower. So when he then heard the garage door open and the car pull in, he immediately panicked. I was frightened to hear this as well. An entity taking my identity made me feel helpless. A coworker got me in contact with her friend who has special abilities. Her friend came over with another medium. They smudged our home and put quartz crystals in the corner. It was all free. They told me that the limestone behind us held energy which attracted transient spirits and entities. Some good, some not. The shadow man stayed because of my husband's PTSD and was attracted to the negativity. They also said domestic abuse had previously occurred in the man cave at some point and that it was a big focus of the negative energy. They taught me to smudge and told me that I have ancestors by my side keeping me safe. Things would still happen on occasion after this. We spoke to our Muslim friends about it and they thought it sounded like a jinn. These creatures are mischievous and can be good or bad. They gave us a religious artifact from their hometown that had a prayer in Arabic carved in it. We kept it on our mantle and never had trouble after that. They would always laugh at us at Christmas time when we had our Christmas mantle decorations and our Muslim artifact. It's still a treasured item that we have to this day. We have since moved, but we did spend a decade in that home. And the more I think about it, the more I'm sure that it was haunted. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around nine o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might have been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again. And this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window and the window is only accessible to someone in the home because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. 
It was also around 9 p.m. at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know, though. What do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? This happened back one summer when I was about 12 or 13, before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we could stay at about four hours north of our home. My father couldn't attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin, which was literally just a 15 by 15 foot room with an attached bathroom, just enough for a bed, a table, and a small TV. And it was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent, I think seven in total, that all arced around in a C shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of the cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed in the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out. Even though it was August, and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. It's in northern Michigan. The gentleman that worked at the front desk and owned the cabins came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact that I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventures that my mother and I were going to have. Climbing the dunes, eating ice cream, swimming, having campfires, all the good stuff. Well. I remember him giving my mom the key and saying the bathroom window is broken and doesn't close all the way, nor does it lock. Which, if we were the only people living there, why not give us a room in which the bathroom did lock? We thought it was kind of strange, but shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back at dusk, and went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get into the truck, but it wouldn't start. Strange, I will admit, at the time it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and being like, oh, your truck is broke? That's too bad, let me call someone. My mom insisted that she could call somebody, went into his office, used his phone, and called somebody to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I kind of shook our heads, confused. Oh, uh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out, but all you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mother where the breaker was, which happened to be outside of the cabin, behind it, on a pole. After getting the truck fixed and having another day of adventure, we came back ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching TV, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she had packed and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anybody would be. We got back in bed and about 10 minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man, which I assume was the owner because nobody else was there, running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day, but still, that guy was creepy.
The last two days have gotten crazy. For the past two years, there's been a tapping sound coming from my bedroom window. It started one Halloween night. I know, it sounds like a bad movie, but bear with me. And it's happened about a few times a month since, sometimes more often. Something taps at the window. There is nothing around to hit the window, and it sounds exactly like a finger tapping on the glass. My siblings and I are just used to it by now. A few days ago, my brother started complaining that something was communicating to him from outside the den window. Keep in mind, we live in an apartment complex, so we always have the blinds closed. He says that whatever it was just kept saying, hello, to him in a robotic, high-pitched voice. The rest of our family just shrugged it off. The day after, we go outside and there are small tracks leading up to all of our windows. I don't know what animal could have made those tracks because it's bipedal. Later that day, I was in my bedroom, laying in the bed that's next to the window, blinds closed, and I about jump out of my skin because someone is loudly banging against the glass. I ignored it. I just assumed it was one of my siblings sneaking up on me. I then found out that they were both together at that moment in the house while it happened and they hadn't been out for hours. The next night, my brother complained about the voice outside his window again, and we told him to ignore it. If it's something supernatural, we don't want to mess with it. Yesterday, while we were all preparing for dinner, my entire family and I heard the creature screaming outside. I was too shocked to move to grab my phone and record it. It kept yelling, Hello, come out! Hello, come out! Exactly how my brother had described. It was so loud we could hear it clearly from the kitchen and the dining room and really the whole house. We didn't want to look outside. This morning, more snow had fallen, but fresh prints were there. I don't know what to make of any of this, but it's impossible for this to be a prank because of the lack of human prints in the snow. I live in Northeast Ohio. If anyone has any information on what this is or has a similar experience, please let me know. So, I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall. Doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So, naturally, I went into his room and told this, what I thought was imaginary, hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again. With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it. Kids will be kids. The next day, I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, 
all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. What's really strange is that my youngest son, Derek, has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. I'm a carer, and I have been for about five or six years. I prefer to work nights, as it's a calmer working experience. I've seen and heard many strange things, but two stick out, and I thought I'd tell you about it. The first one. I was on shift one night, and every hour we have to do checks on the residents to make sure that they're okay and still with us. So I'm doing my checks, and everything is going okay, until I get to the last room. This lady likes her door closed at night, so the light in the corridor doesn't wake her up. And I go to open her door, but I couldn't move it. It was as if someone was pushing it shut from the other side. I try two or three times to open it, and it just won't budge. Fearing that the lady has fallen behind it, I go to get the nurse on shift and my colleagues. Each of us try to open the door, but it won't move. After 20 minutes or so, the door opens easily, as it should do, and the lady was asleep in bed, snoring away, and there's nothing there to have kept the door closed. I should mention that this was in a part of the building that no one likes to be alone in, as it always feels like you're being watched. On a couple of occasions, a shadow has been seen in some of the rooms. The second, I came in on shift and found out that one of the residents had passed away just 30 minutes before the night staff got there. We were waiting for the undertakers to come and collect the body. It could be up to two hours before they got there. As we were going about our job, the buzzer went off in that room. I went and switched it off and left the room. His buzzer went off every 10 minutes until the undertakers arrived and none of us could ever explain why or how it was doing that. I'm a strong believer in listening to my gut. I always have been and always will be, since it's gotten me out of a few situations. One was my freshman year of high school. School had ended for the day, and since I was staying at my dad's house that week, I decided I would walk home. His house wasn't that far from school. Everything was fine, until I turned down the street where there's a shortcut. It led straight into my neighborhood. As I was walking to the shortcut, a man drove by staring at me. My stomach dropped and turned I took this as a note to walk a bit faster. By the time I got into my neighborhood, the man was circling around the cul-de-sac, waiting for me. He had a smirk slowly creeping onto his face as I walked by his car. I tried to ignore him the best I could and just kept walking. He would drive past me and yell vulgar things at me. He kept turning around and driving past me again and again. As I turned down my street, he followed closely behind. I saw him drive down my street and turn into someone's driveway to turn back around. I quickly got into my house and locked the door behind me. I then turned around to look through the peephole so I could see if he left. He didn't. The man pulled up into my driveway and got out of the car. Luckily, my neighbor, who's a family friend, was out in his garage. He came over yelling at the man and then stayed with me until my dad got home. A week later, my dad told me he saw the man parked at the end of the street, waiting for me. He went and threatened the man and we haven't seen him since, but I'm still freaked out every time I go and visit my dad. It's safe to say I won't be walking home alone ever again.
This past New Year's was mine and my boyfriend's four year anniversary. We typically don't do much, so this year we decided to make it special by planning a romantic getaway. At the time, the two of us were living in Seattle and wanted to rent a cabin in a snowy small town for the weekend. We found an Airbnb with a hot tub and we were sold. The cabin was, of course, the last house on the road. To get to it, you had to drive down a small removed private road that ended in a roundabout. Off the roundabout was a long uphill driveway leading to our cabin. We got to the cabin and it was snowy and beautiful. The cabin itself sat on top of a garage and you needed to take stairs on the back side of the property to get to the front door. When we got inside, there was a booklet with all of the cabin's info outlined. The book said that during the snowy season, don't be surprised if their contracted snowplowers showed up to clear off the driveway. Okay, sounds good. We unpacked and realized that there was no service on either of our phones, but the booklet told us there was a landline in the cabin if we needed anything. We spent the first night by the fire, playing board games and drinking wine. The weekend was exactly what we needed. We planned to spend the next day in town, and that night, I had booked us a reservation for a nice dinner. We were gone almost all day, only returning briefly to get dressed up and enjoy some good food. Dinner was great, and we were excited to head back to the cabin for some champagne hot tubbing. While at dinner, the temperature had dropped and it snowed for the first time that day, coating everything in a fresh layer of powder. We drove down the private road and got to the driveway. At that point, my boyfriend stopped the car, headlights shining in front, and asked if I noticed the new tire tracks. I looked at the driveway, hoping to quickly disregard the new tire tracks, but there they were. Immediately, we remembered that the snowplowers could have stopped by, but the issue was we saw the tire tracks because of the snow and who plows in the dark. We also knew that once we were at the cabin, we had no service on our cell phones. So we figured that we would head back into town and message our Airbnb hosts and ask them if them or one of their friends had stopped by the apartments. We waited for a while in town for a reply from our hosts, but didn't hear back. We could have called at that point, but it was past 10 and we didn't want to be bad guests. We figured we blew the whole thing out of proportion and might as well head back to the cabin. After all, I am big into true crime, spooky subreddits, and horror movies, so I figured I was probably just psyching myself out. My boyfriend drove us back and this time we actually drove up the driveway. Toward the top of the hill, I noticed something. My stomach dropped as I noticed footprints on the property. We backed down the driveway and took a closer look to see if there were more footprints. From what it looked like, someone had driven up the driveway, reversed down, parked, and then got out of the car and walked onto the property. Since we had now also driven on the tracks, we couldn't find where the footprints ended. The property was quite large, with tons of trees and brush, and we knew that these footprints could go anywhere. The moment we saw footprints, we decided to call the police. We figured it was better safe than sorry. We would just have the officer go onto the property with us to check everything out. We drove down the road until we had service, called the police, and waited for their arrival. The policeman showed up and we followed him onto the property. The police officer scanned the property and determined that there was nobody out there. Obviously, we were a little shaken up and a lot embarrassed, but we thanked the officer as he left. Needless to say, neither of us wanted to sit in the hot tub in the dark woods after what we'd seen. Instead, we locked the doors and watched a movie, Champagneless. We were both tired from the day and we passed out pretty quickly. At 3 a.m. we both woke up on the couch with the TV on and all the lights, laughing about how the night hadn't turned out quite as planned. As my boyfriend went to brush his teeth, 
we heard a noise. It sounded mechanical, and it only lasted a few seconds. We looked at each other and froze. The garage door. There are very few reasons that somebody would need to open the garage door of a guest-occupied Airbnb at 3 in the morning. Like I said, we woke up to all of our lights on, and the cabin had lots of windows. We knew that if somebody was outside, they knew we were there, and they could see us. I immediately grabbed the landline and dialed 911. We sat crouched in the Airbnb, praying for the police to arrive. We knew that whoever had made those tracks was still on the property, and this time they were making noise. As I sat talking to the operator, we heard a bang on our balcony, as if somebody had thrown something up onto it. I was losing my absolute mind when the operator told me that the police were nearby. All of a sudden, they were there. We saw the police lights and watched them search the property. Soon we heard banging on the door. It was the police. We were okay. At the door were two policemen, one right in front of us and one a little bit behind, kind of kicking around snow and looking at the ground. I immediately noticed that the police officer in the back was the one that had done the initial check on the property. The police officer told us that not only was the garage door shut, but it was locked, and again, there were no signs of somebody on the property. We discussed leaving, but the police officer said that the road conditions were too dangerous at that time of night. I looked over at the police officer who had to come out to the property twice, and I felt that I had deeply disappointed him. My boyfriend and I went back inside, again locking all the doors, and tried to sleep. The next day, we were leaving, and while we survived the night, I didn't feel right in the cabin anymore. It was forever the spooky cabin in my head, and I wanted to leave. As we packed, we heard the same noise that we had heard at 3 a.m. It turns out it was the heater. A heater that sounded just like the garage and lasted for the same duration. My boyfriend looked at me and immediately said, you really need to give up your murder shows, and walked away, as if. As for the banging on the balcony, it was just the perfectly timed fall of a pine cone. A really big pine cone. I promise I'm not paranoid. I think back on this story a lot, and I'm very embarrassed about how little came of it, but also incredibly grateful for the same reason. But, still, Somebody drove onto that property and walked around. And that part still deeply unsettles me. Last night, I went to pick up my dog from my dad's house and something really weird happened. It was around 10 p.m. and I picked up my dog. I've driven from my dad's house at night a thousand times and I know the road back like the back of my hand. He lives on a ranch and to get back to the freeway, you have to turn left when the road forks. So I'm driving to the end of this road, but the fork never comes. I keep driving on and on and on, but the road isn't ending. After a good 10 minutes, and note that this road is rather short and should have only taken me about 2 minutes, the road finally forks. I make a left, and on the side of the road I see glowing eyes, like cat eyes. Then the road just ends into a big ditch. This road should have led to the freeway. I turned around and started driving back, when all of a sudden, a dog jumps on the side of my car. This thing is growling and snarling at the window. This is gonna sound lame, but it's the truth. I got chills and a really bad feeling of dread, and I'm like 90% sure that that was not a dog. I slowed down, panicking, because I thought I was going to accidentally hit this dog. I love dogs, even demonic ones, but then it just disappears. 
I looked around the car with my flashlight, and this thing was just gone. I floored it out of there and turned back onto what I thought was the main road, and kept driving. I got the GPS to navigate back to my house, and it said that I was a little less than 10 miles away from the freeway. This is literally impossible, because the road that my dad lives on is not that long, nor does it lead to any other road that long. I was so panicked that I floored it home, and I forgot to expand the map to see where the heck I was. Once I got home and calmed down, I went on Google Earth to try to see where I went, and it doesn't exist. There's not a single road that long, nor anything that resembles what I saw anywhere in that area. I have no clue what happened, and my friend and I are convinced that I traveled into an alternate universe for a little bit last night, that the cat that turned into the dog was a skinwalker. Whatever else, we don't really know. My mother is the sweetest woman. Sometimes, she slips money into my wallet for things, even though at this point in my life I don't really need it, thankfully. I recently used my PayPal account to order and ship something for her, because she had forgotten the password to her own account. It cost about $20, and I never thought about it again. She, not surprisingly, left a $20 bill on my kitchen counter a week or so later. I found it after she left, stuck it in my purse, and then went to sleep. I randomly remembered it a couple of days later, and I sent her a quick text message while she was at work that said, Oh, I did find that $20 you left. Thank you. That's all it said. She sent me a message about an hour later that said, That was the cutest picture of you, but now I can't find it. I asked which photo, because of course all I had sent was the text. No photo. She said she was busy at work, but on the screen she saw the small unread text and a photo so she quickly opened it to see the full photo of me. She showed it to her co-worker, so she's not the only one who saw this. She described the photo. She said I was holding a $20 bill right under my face and cheesing hard. She described my shirt and my hairstyle. Here's the thing. She described exactly how I was dressed and exactly how I had done my hair that day. But I'm a million percent sure that I never took a photo, nor did I send her one. Just a thank you text. She was trying to figure out how I could delete the photo after sending it to her phone. If that is possible, I certainly am not capable of doing it, nor would I. All I can think is that there was some kind of glitch. This isn't the first time I've experienced a glitch, but it is the first in a long time and I just thought I would share. So my family and I moved into a new house, which is a two by four house. It used to have an attic, but it's been sealed off. After a couple of months into living in this house, sometimes I would be watching TV and hear scratching from the roof. I just played it off, as birds are very common where I live. After about three weeks, the scratching got worse and more frequent. It's like something's trying to scratch its way out of the roof. The attic entrance thing is above the outside of my sister's room. One day, my sister tells my dad that the seal is open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off. My dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close, so whatever opened it had to be strong, and that's when I started to get skeptical. The same night, I went to get some snacks from the fridge. I opened it to find out that they were gone. I figured that my siblings must have eaten them. In the morning, my parents are going on and on about a missing cake. That cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They asked if I had anything to do with it, 
and I said no, along with my siblings. I was getting really suspicious about the attic, so one day I built up the courage to go check it out. Note that I am probably the most paranoid person in the world, so I was scared for my life, but my curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch, and a knife just in case. I open the thing up and I shine my torch to see nothing. But as I search more, I see the cake, empty snack packets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette that freezes in its spot. Immediately I bold and scream for my parents and I tell them everything. They tell me to stay in my room. They go up and check, but he was gone. I am still shaken up about that moment and I get nightmares from it to this day. We've since moved from that house and haven't had any more issues like that and we live a normal, non-scary life, but I think that day will live with me forever. I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. My mom was dating this guy who wasn't like a super country guy, but not like a normal country guy either. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not too secluded, like there were other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was this abandoned house that pretty much looked exactly what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. My stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while just for fun, and we would see some pretty weird stuff. Like a random chair in the middle of a room, a cooler full of dead roses. But one day, we were headed in there like usual. But I took one step in and I wanted to throw up. My stepbrother kept going and was telling me it was fine and to just come in but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by, and all of a sudden my brother's face turns pale as hell. He drops his water bottle and he runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down, and he says that we're never going back in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. And true to his word, we never went back in there again. And this happened a few years back. I was visiting the US in Arizona because my cousin was graduating from college. I promised that I would arrive a night before his graduation to help him put the house in party condition. I arrived on a pretty late flight and I didn't have my own car, so my cousin came to pick me up from the airport. It was about two o'clock in the morning and we were driving on a long road that was basically in the middle of nowhere. I was about to fall asleep, but my cousin woke me up and said that there was a wolf right in front of us next to the road. I had never seen a wolf in the wild before, so it was a little exciting. Just when we were about to drive past him, he stood up and started running, with only two feet. He was running right next to our car for about five seconds, and when we looked at him again, he looked more like a human who was wearing animal fur on his upper body. After telling the story to others, they told me that we probably saw a skinwalker. What do you guys think? Has anyone else experienced something like this? This happened to me when I was in the fourth grade. I moved into a new school. 
Someone once said to me that the stairs in that school were haunted. The story goes that one day some students were going down the stairs when they got pushed. A teacher just walked by and asked, what happened? Who pushed you? And at that exact moment, the teacher herself got pushed. Another story goes that this particular ghost was running around the hallway during assembly. Also, this ghost apparently had no arms or legs. I asked other people if this was true, and they said that it was. So I got curious, and I decided to check it out with one of my friends at break. So to get to this supposedly haunted staircase, you had to go through a door. In front of that door is another door. Open that door, and the stairs are right there. My friends and I opened the first door, and were about to open the second. But then I saw something. A shadowy figure that seemed to have no arms. My friend saw it too, so we ran out the back door to the playground. Now you might say that it could have just been a shadow of someone else, but the figure was standing right in the middle of the stairs, not against a wall or anything like that. I never used those stairs again, unless I was walking with a teacher or a group of people. To this day, I still wonder if I imagined it, or if that thing was really there. I would like to preface this by saying that typically I don't believe in the paranormal, but I can find no reasonable explanation as to what is causing this. Hopefully, somebody is able to offer any ideas as to what this might be. Before my parents bought our house, the entryway to the attic used to be in what is now my closet. It got sealed up with boards and there's no way to get in there now, at least not through my room. Instead, you have to use stairs that you can bring down in the hallway in order to get up there. So there shouldn't be anything in my closet or in the area above my closet in the attic. Yet I can hear a distinctive sound of something scratching in there. I looked through the closet and it's not all that big. You can barely fit two people inside of it and I can't find what's making that noise. The only way into the attic is through those stairs and they're in the hallway, like I said, outside of my door. I would have to have heard somebody bring them down. They squeak. Also, the attic is pretty much filled with insulation, making it virtually impossible to walk around up there. So what's making the noise? We had exterminators go up there and look, and there was no evidence of any animals. I wouldn't know how any animals would get there anyway, since it's basically blocked off from the rest of the house, and nobody's been up there in years. But the noise continues, and it's very loud, and it keeps me awake. I can hear it, even when I have headphones on with the volume all the way up. It sounds like something is trying to get out. About two years ago, my mom told me to go to the attic to put away some decorations from Halloween. I made a few rounds when all of a sudden I noticed a cat out of the corner of my eye. It had no body or head, just white ears, legs, and a tail. When I told my mom about it, she went to the attic to try to find it, but she found nothing. The other time I believe that I encountered it was when I was walking to my parents' room. I started to hear a cat screaming at the door of the attic. It sounded like a kitten or a young cat. None of my cats scream like what I heard. I opened the door and the screaming stopped and there was no cat. When I told my mom about the screaming, she went up to find my oldest cat under the guest bed and nowhere near the door. Also, the cat that I saw didn't look like any of our cats, even from the parts I could see. I'm not sure if it's a spirit of my neighbor's cat that died a couple of years ago or something else, but it's definitely weird.
I am a 30-year-old male. When I was in my early 20s, I had a strange encounter with a man who claimed to be from my future. I'm not entirely sure that this could be considered a glitch. However, this incident was definitely peculiar and I haven't been able to completely forget about it since. Admittedly, some details are now hazy, as this happened to me over 10 years ago, but I have tried my hardest to remember as much information as I could in hopes of getting some closure. Around 2011, I was taking Japanese night classes once per week at a local university here in the UK. At the time, my classes would finish at around 9pm, and I would usually return home via train. I was still living with my parents back then, and I distinctly remember having a small window of time to catch the infrequent night train back to my hometown after my lessons would end. It was winter, and I recall the station being busy with Christmas shoppers. I had unfortunately missed my usual train, and had to wait over an hour for the next arrival. I was looking up at the live departure board with frustration when I was approached by a friendly American man in his early to mid 40s. I remember that he was underdressed for the weather, or even the season, as it had been snowing for days and was particularly cold outside. He was wearing only a baseball cap, a sweatshirt, and a light windbreaker. Nothing about this struck me as too odd at the time, as I gathered he must just be a tourist who had not anticipated how cold it could be. Back then, I was incredibly shy, and I wasn't the type to strike up conversations with strangers. However, I recall feeling entirely at ease from the moment I saw him. He was tall, athletic, and spoke with a strong accent. He was friendly and approachable. Nothing about him gave off any warning signals. If anything, I was taken aback at how unconventionally attractive he was. Our first interaction was brief. He initiated our conversation by asking if I had been waiting long. I naturally replied out of politeness if he had been stuck waiting for a while too. He was in fact, quote, waiting for a friend and had just gotten into town. This quickly evolved into us both making small talk, with him introducing himself as John. Eventually, he asked if I wanted to grab a coffee on the account of how easily we hit things off. My train was due to arrive and I didn't have much time, so John quickly asked if I wanted to pick up where we'd left off again over coffee tomorrow. I agreed, we exchanged numbers, and I left to catch my train home. I remember after this instance, I felt a feeling similar to deja vu. It was like a wave of familiarity had washed over me. I was 100% sure that I had never met John in my life. However, I was left with this strange, overwhelming feeling after departing. I felt intrigued by him. When I arrived home, I received a few text messages from John and we agreed to meet up in the same location the following day. At this time in my life, I was still closeted and I hadn't come out to my parents as being gay, and I wasn't prepared to tell them I was meeting with a stranger. I usually pride myself on being a good judge of character, and I would not have agreed to meet John if I hadn't felt that the situation was safe. After all, it was difficult to meet guys at that age, and I wasn't about to pass up the opportunity of a date with this handsome older dude who I just felt an abundance of chemistry with. However, I did make sure to let some of my friends know my situation in case anything were to happen. The following day, John was waiting for me at the same location we had met the night before. Despite the freezing weather, he was still wearing the same light clothing and baseball cap. I can recall him being incredibly charming, and I felt the same overwhelming sense of being familiar with him from the moment we met. I was definitely curious, and I was eager to find out more about him. At this point, we couldn't decide on a location and wandered aimlessly around before deciding to grab coffee at a local Starbucks. As we started to make conversation, I noticed that he was only interested in talking about what I had to say. I remember that he seemed overly happy to be talking with me. When I would speak, he was often so excited that he would barely let me finish before moving on to another topic of conversation. 
I almost got the impression that he knew what I was about to say already. For instance, he knew that I had a sister before I told him. I also noticed that he would rarely talk about himself, often sidestepping my questions or changing the flow of conversation when I asked him anything directly. He was definitely quirky, and for the most part we spoke about our shared interests. I remember thinking that he was odd, but I definitely didn't feel suspicious of him, despite the fact that he seemed rather private. The only information I remember about him was that he was from America, but that he had been traveling for some time, the way he put it. He claimed to play several instruments, and was in a band, and he mentioned that he had a troubled religious upbringing. However, this is where things get strange. John and I left the coffee shop and decided to go for another walk around the city. We spoke for a long time, and I remember that we'd been laughing a lot and generally enjoying the time we'd spent together. However, we eventually stopped along the riverfront that runs throughout my city, leaning over a bridge as we spoke some more about each other's lives. This is when John asked if he could give me a hug. I remember looking up at him, and his expression seemed genuinely melancholic all of a sudden. Almost bittersweet. Although I was feeling a little confused, I said of course, and hesitantly leaned in for the embrace. I remember that he hugged me incredibly tightly, and when we eventually let go, there were tears in his eyes. I asked him if he was okay, and asked what was going on. Admittedly now feeling incredibly confused and a little bit concerned by what was happening all of a sudden, he said, you're never going to believe me. I can't quite remember the entire flow of the conversation that followed, however, I will try to summarize everything as best I can. We took a seat on a nearby bench, where I remember that his composure was incredibly calm, and he said everything with the sincerest conviction. He told me that he was somebody from my near future, and that we knew each other very well. He told me that he had traveled back in time to visit me. However, he was incredibly adamant about not answering how or why he had managed to do so, only stating that it was, quote, recreational, and that time travel, quote, doesn't work how we think, stating to me that he had only wanted to visit me once more, adding that I was much younger than he had anticipated, and that I looked so different from when he knew me. He almost hinted that he had found me at the wrong age. I could tell that there was a feeling of sadness throughout everything he was telling me, as he kept repeating over and over how happy he was to see me, yet he said everything with tears in his eyes. I instantly began taking everything he was saying as a joke, feeling skeptical and ready to leave immediately. I remember standing up and telling him that I had to go. The information was too much for me to process, and I felt the same overwhelming flood of deja vu creep back into my system. The sensation was so intense that I remember trembling as I stood up to leave, with the atmosphere around me suddenly experiencing a drop in pressure. This is when he took me by the hand and said, I'll see you again someday. I ran away without saying anything. I remember being so overcome by emotion that I burst into tears as soon as I was out of sight. Afterwards, I was so confused and disturbed by the situation, it took me days to process it all before attempting to articulate it to my younger sister and friends, all of whom remember this incident as the crazy tourist I went on a date with. However, 10 years have passed, and I can't help but feel affected by this incident. Every now and then, I remember the face of John and the strange feeling of contentment and familiarity I had around him. After our date, I remember trying to text or call the number that he'd contacted me on, only to be notified that that number no longer exists by an automated message. He had seemingly vanished without a trace, with no further instances of seeing or being contacted by him since. This definitely could have been a case of an individual who was clearly unhinged, but it was so eerie that I haven't been able to forget about it. I have always wondered who John was, or perhaps who I was to him in this possible future.
Nowadays, I am currently in a happy relationship with my partner of six years, whom I have no intention of ever leaving. But every time I recall this enigmatic encounter I had with John, I can't help but wonder if I had glimpsed into a possible or parallel future, one where things have drastically changed for me on a personal level. I have so many questions surrounding what he told me. Was I still alive in his time? Were we romantically involved? Was he a future colleague or even family? Every time I recall these long distant memories, I'm overcome by an inexplicable wave of emotion, almost like I've lost something. It's incredibly difficult for me to articulate the feeling that I felt that night. I have never been able to forget about it, and I am entirely sure that I would still recognize John today if I ever encountered him again. This is the first time I have ever shared the full version of this story outside of my immediate circle, but after discovering the community here, I felt the need to share. Has anyone ever experienced anything similar? Or have perhaps read other relatable stories or have suggestions or ideas? I've felt almost haunted by this meeting since it happened, and I would love a little bit of insight from those more experienced in theories and concepts of time travels and glitches. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now, and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13-year-old's perspective, and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house, and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house, in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it, and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields, until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, 
we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still, staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first, and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing but that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious, and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight, was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl we realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. 
My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, There's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us, and that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridal path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Literal, rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in the search. 
Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Ryan is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. I don't know if there's anything bad about this, but it's freaking me out anyway. In the place that I'm living in, we don't have an attic. At least that's what my parents keep telling me. But once in a while, there's something that's above me that keeps following me whenever I move. If I move to the hallway and to my bathroom and wait a little, I can hear loud creaking and footsteps above me, moving in the same direction and stopping right above my head. This started off small, and I thought the place was just an old house. But it's just so loud now that it feels like somebody's up there. The noises are way too loud to be a small animal's. Also, I don't know if it's related, but one night when I was on my computer in my dark room, I didn't see anything, but I could tell that there was something staring at me to my right. My brain screamed at me not to look, but that feeling wouldn't go away for hours. When I eventually tried heading off to sleep, putting my computer to the side for a light source, for some reason I decided to put up my legs, and I swear I felt something trying to pull or push them down hard. Nothing like that has happened again since that night, but part of me feels like it may happen again. Another thing that's weird, too, is that I haven't heard the sound when it wasn't physically possible to, like when I listened to music or had my ears blocked. So, I think it's more natural than supernatural, but I don't know. Either way, it freaks me out.
It's currently 12.03 a.m. and I'm still processing what happened today. I was home with just my nephew, who was taking a shower, so nobody could have opened the door. A little backstory. My dog Ziggy and I were outside so he could take care of business. When he was done, we came back in. As we're coming inside, my nephew is pulling up. He comes in and gets in the shower. I come into my bedroom, leaving Ziggy in the living room. I walk up to my bedroom window, and I see Ziggy running from the china berry tree in the yard to the corner of the house. Instantly tripping, I run from the bedroom to the front door, which is right by my bedroom. I open the door and call for him. As I'm calling his name, my nephew opens the bathroom door. He's right here, he says. Now when I tell you my mind was warped, I mean it was gone. I stood there for five minutes, staring. I didn't know what to think. He was literally just running in the yard two seconds ago. How the hell did that happen? I was so confused. Has this happened to anybody else? I have a ghost in my life, and I have named him Toby. The name from the Paranormal Activity franchise. It's to make light of a creepy situation. Oddly enough, I would say that 98% of my encounters with my ghost, I was never alone. There was usually another person with me when he would make an appearance. This all started with a single photo that I took. I should give more context. So before I moved out for school, I lived on an acreage with my dad and brother, and this area has small abandoned buildings everywhere that can be easily explored. So between the ages of 17 and 18, I had some friends over, two guys and three girls including myself, and we would go exploring and get our spook on. We had some scary moments, but I am also chalking it up to overactive imaginations and purposefully scaring each other. This time was no different than the others, we thought. We went to this little church near my dad's house and we did some exploring. We managed our way in and looked around. The girls and I spooked ourselves and hightailed it back to the truck, and the guys were laughing at us. I decided to take a picture of them. I was periodically taking photos throughout the night. The next day we all woke up and I was looking through my photos and noticed that I had captured something else in one particular photo. It really creeped me out, but it eventually was just forgotten. Not long after I started having nightmares and these nightmares are recurring and can last anywhere between one night to a whole year. I am 24 years old now, and I still get them. Initially, I didn't put two and two together, until a friend of mine noticed my ghost and nightmares started happening at the same time. My nightmares are also important to my spooky happenings, or at least I feel like they are. Now for the meat of the story. A few months after graduating high school, I moved eight hours away from home with my best friend and then boyfriend for college. At the time, I have been getting this particular nightmare of a horse being dismembered alive, and I was stuck in place and couldn't do anything to help. It was disrupting my sleep, and I would say that I was having this nightmare anywhere between one to three times a week for a year. A year and a half later, after moving to this new city, things happened and my best friend and I were looking for somewhere else to live. We'd asked a friend that we'd become very close with to move in with us. We found a little three-bedroom townhouse on the west side of the city. We also had the best friend's brother and my cousin staying in the basement temporarily. It was a cramped house, but we made it work. The townhouse is when Toby made his first appearance. The layout of this place was simple. You walk in, there are stairs going up to your right, and straight ahead, you can see the kitchen and living room. They were separated by a wall. I believe this was a Friday or a Saturday night, 
in the winter time in Canada, because I remember fondly that I was home alone and the others were out being busy. I was in the living room studying with no TV on, and I heard this very distinct man sneeze come from the kitchen. I just froze because it was so unexpected and so close. I remember going through the entire house to see if I was truly alone. Once I realized that I was indeed by myself, I called my best friend and told her to come home because I was scared. They ended up laughing at me because they just assumed that I had an active imagination, but oh boy, were they going to find out that they were wrong. Around this time, I was nightmare-free for maybe a few months, and after Toby's first appearance, they started up again, but it was a different one. I had a recurring dream of me watching this man being eaten alive by a bear, and again I was frozen in place and I couldn't help. So a month or so after the sneeze, my friend and roommate and I were watching TV. We were the only ones home at the time, and our stairway had photos and paintings and frames. Every single one of them came crashing down at the same time. The stairway has no windows in it, and it was cold outside, so no wind could have knocked them down. We went to investigate, and every single one of them was on the ground. We were pretty scared at that point, but we hung them back up. Over a period of time, we would learn that we couldn't keep anything on the walls. After some time, we had to move out due to the landlord selling the place, and we moved to this condo. It was a beautiful place. I started getting more and worse nightmares, and they were alternating between four dreams. Two events happened in this condo, and I also forgot to mention that I had two cats this entire time they began to interact with Toby in this place. For the first occurrence, all of us were sitting on the couch in the living room, and the couch is parallel with the stairs going up. It was nighttime, and both cats got fuzzy-tailed and stared intently upstairs, growling. Everyone who lived at this place was in the living room. It creeped us out, but we just made a joke out of it and tried to keep it light. For the second occurrence, I was having a brand new nightmare. In my dream, I was actively being decapitated, and in real life, my neck was getting hot. I couldn't breathe, and I felt like I was falling out of consciousness, but I woke up screaming, crying, and holding my neck. Then I thought I saw something by the door. My then-boyfriend woke up to my screaming and said he thought he saw something in the room, but that it was so dark it could have been nothing. I hadn't mentioned that I also saw something until after he said something, and this is when I started to fear Toby. We lived there for about a year and a half, roughly, before the other girls moved in with their boyfriends, and I moved into a big house that my then-boyfriend's family owned. The mother and sister said that they felt uneasy in that house when they visited, but I figured it couldn't be worse than my nightmares. So, I had two people move in with me, and they experienced things as well. The nightmares were becoming less severe, and I was down to just one nightmare, maybe one to two a week, and it was a small kitten being tortured. It made me really sad in real life, and I would wake up unhappy. This house has two sub-basements, and the first sub-basement was a second living room. The second one had a bedroom with no windows, a bathroom, and a laundry. Our stuff was going missing and then turning up in random places. The front door would just open. My brother came down to visit me, and my other two roommates were working. We were watching a spooky movie in the living room sub-basement, and my one cat was sitting on the arm of the couch that we were sitting on. She quickly turned her head toward the stairs, going down, got up all fuzzied up, and stared intently at the darkness. Her eyes followed something that we couldn't see to the stairs going up. She laid back down, but wouldn't look away from the stairs. My brother looked at me and said that that was damn creepy, and I agreed. A couple of months later, I was doing laundry, and my roommate's bedroom door starts to shake 
quite violently as he was headed to his room. We both just stood there, looking at the door, perplexed. And suddenly it just stopped. He didn't want to enter his room alone, so I went in with him for peace of mind. Everything was normal in the room, so I left to finish the laundry. It was rather creepy. I moved again. I know, I move a lot. And I lived with my best friend and her boyfriend in June 2018. This is when all Toby occurrences and nightmares completely stopped. Like, as soon as I moved in. It was wonderful. I took the silence for granted, though. A week before Christmas, I experienced my first form of sleep paralysis. And I say form because it wasn't the classic type of sleep paralysis. This scared me so badly, to the point that I could not sleep at all the rest of the night and was noticeably off for the day. My sleep paralysis, I had no idea that I was asleep. Like, honestly, I had no idea that I was asleep. I thought everything happening in my dream was real. I could move, or it felt like moving. In this dream, I was on YouTube, and randomly a deep web YouTube took over. This horribly graphic video was flooding my screen, and I felt the panic of trying to get rid of it, to force it to shut down. But the videos just wouldn't go away. I was in full panic mode, and I couldn't stop it. And then I woke up. I was really bothered because I had zero idea that I was asleep. I felt like I could feel the laptop in my hands, and I still felt the panic. After that radio silence since March of 2019, my male cat, who was six, died suddenly with no previous medical conditions. My friends believe it was Toby. I moved in with my current boyfriend, and I hadn't had any nightmares since Christmas of last year and no Toby, until last weekend. He plucked the boyfriend's acoustic guitar loudly and distinctly, and I also had a new nightmare last night. So far, these are all of my occurrences, but this is definitely an ongoing situation. I just want to live my life in peace. Update. So, this morning, my boyfriend wakes me up at 5.30 a.m. He leaves at 6 a.m., and I wake up at 7 a.m. I had a new nightmare in that hour of being alone. I woke up to this feeling of just gloom since I hate these types of nightmares. My cat sits with me as I put on my makeup on the couch and I hear stuff falling and quiet thumps downstairs. I found the blanket cupboard was open and all of the blankets were on the ground. I can only imagine what Toby will do next. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, turn on that light, I'm up here. Now we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs, and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. 
She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. Who or what made that sound, and how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best, the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it well enough to fool both my sister and I? To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows? This happened on a family trip to Texas. We rented an RV to travel across the state with. We live in Florida. We left on a Tuesday. We were off to Texas to visit my cousin and her kids, so the family decided since we're here, why not go to Arizona to see the Grand Canyon, Mystery Mountain, OK Corral, and the Painted Desert. The interesting part of the story happened when heading into Mystery Mountain. We had to travel around this dark, deserted track around the mountain with no guardrail. And if you opened your door, you were looking down a cliff. So we traveled, and my father had rented an SUV to make his trip. He calls it white knuckling when you drive some dangerous roads. We didn't see any other lights than the ones from our headlights, and finally we get all the way to the bottom. All of the men get out of the car to use the bathroom. Like I said, no lights on the way up or behind us. No one leading up to the track we had taken. Then we see something strange. A motorcycle passes us with a female and a male on it. It was not going that fast. The thing that was odd, other than the fact that we didn't see their lights, is that the bike went about 30 feet and then disappeared. We saw all of it and then poof, nothing. To this day, none of us can explain what happened. I'm not sure if this is considered a glitch, but most nights, and I mean not every night, I can hear people talking. I can never fully hear what they're saying, but I hear people chatting back and forth. I wish I could say I hear the same people talking, but every time I hear them, it's not always the same voices. I do live in a building with four other tenants, but the thing is, I usually hear this chattering at odd hours of the night. It's when my well-known neighbors are asleep. I work in a kitchen, and I usually don't get home from work until at least 1 a.m., so I'm usually up until about six. I could chalk it up to spiritual activity, but it doesn't feel like that. It's almost like I'm hearing a life that I've lived somewhere else or that other people have lived here over the years. Like I'm hearing things from other dimensions or past times. It may be odd to say, and I'm okay with being completely wrong, but it's as if the memories of these walls are speaking at night. The word is that the building I live in used to be a bed and breakfast, so this place definitely has some stories and has seen a lot of different faces in its day. It would make sense that I would be hearing different voices every time, but it's really interesting to me. I am very interested in learning about what it is I'm experiencing, so if you have any ideas, let me know. 